climate by half post. One of the 50 most influential people on sustainability by People magazine and received the Environmental Voice Arts Award on behalf of the Society of Voice Arts and Sciences. Please welcome to the stage Vanessa Hauck. Muy buenos días para todos y para todas. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? Good, wonderful. Well, I'm wishing you a warm welcome on the final day of the C40 War Mayor Summit here in Buenos Aires. It is my pleasure to be here with you, both in person and also in line, because I know that yesterday we have more than 1.3 million viewers that tune in to the live stream. And I hope that you continue to watch because we have an amazing program today. So, so thank you for being with us. Throughout yesterday's session, we hear from a variety of speakers about how cities can lead a just transition and ensure that climate action is inclusive and equitable and improve personal well-being and public health. Cities are realizing that in order to achieve climate justice, they need a combination of support mechanisms and resources. But how can they access those essential elements? Today's programs will explore what mayors and city leaders need to turn their targets into reality and make sure their cities are resilient, healthy and equitable for all. To kick off this morning's session, our line tap of speakers will discuss the strategies cities can implement to improve waste management, reduce carbon and methane emissions, and create economic opportunities and a fair consumption space for everyone. So, um, I also want to remind you to keep the conversation going on social media, and please don't forget to include the hashtag C40 Summit and the hashtag United in Action to all your posts. So let's get started. I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker of the day, Mayor of Milan, Giuseppe Sala. Dear friends and colleagues, good morning from Milan. We all know we are fast running out of time to keep the world's commitment to limit global heating of 1.5 degrees. Now, while uh, C40's uh, cities production-based emissions are declined, methane and consumption-based emissions are rising, are rising very, very rapidly, despite uh, the zero pledge and broad effort to reduce uh, emission. But let's start uh, first from the methane, because you might wonder if uh, it is so important. Why hasn't it been uh, so clearly on our agenda? Well, methane has always been uh, a concern, but we have only really started uh, to grasp how you, you just uh, with the recent uh, development in satellite data. Because the way we calculate uh, emissions has honestly masked the impact on methane for a very, very long, long period. But let me try to explain why. When we calculate emissions, we normalize all the gases uh, into carbon dioxide equivalent on 100 year basis. And to help you understand the science, methane only stays in the atmosphere less than 20 years. But in that time, it is 80 times more powerful than carbon. This means we dangerously under underestimate the destructive impact on methane happening right now. Now, the good news is aggressive action on methane has the ability to slow warming much faster than action on carbon. So we see a very clearly a risk, but we have to consider this risk even opportunity. Question is, 
how to go about it, we people cause uh, about 60% uh, of methane emissions. About 32, 32% is the, of that is from uh, raising cattle for meat and dairy consumption. About 8% is from uh, growing rice. Another 18% comes from landfills, mostly from uh, unheated food and organic matter decomposing. And then there is the rest of 2% uh, of leakage uh, in energy system uh, using methane gas. We reduce emissions caused by methane and we may or know, having a, a very powerful tool to start with, improving our food and waste system. As we have shown with the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact and C40 food system work, we can let change to make it easier for people to eat plant-based diets and advance toward zero waste. But while uh, I have shown uh, the urgency of addressing uh, methane, our opportunity to reduce emission cannot end uh, with improving uh, food systems and uh, eliminating waste. Our climate match hides other opportunities. Traditionally in cities, we calculate our emission by looking at what is generated in the cities. But what if we look at all the emissions that are created by what, by what we demand in cities? Well, C40 started doing a so in 2019, finding out that the emissions caused by consumption in our cities were approximately 60% higher than traditional inventories. In other words, when we account all the demand for products and services from food to clothes, houses, appliances, and cars, and include the emission created as well from making those things, our city's climate pollution impact rises exponentially. Global carbon emission is dropped by 5% in 2020 due to the pandemic uh, lockdown, and we saw the same uh, in Milan. But by mid-2021, they rebounded, uh, and preliminary new data indicate that are higher now than they were before the pandemic. This rise in emission is fueled by overconsumption. Another, another key element in this uh, narrative is other consumption uh, emissions are not created equally. A study released uh, this month from the Paris School of Economics estimates that just 1% uh, of the people are responsible for about 25% of the growth in global emission since 1990. Another early study from uh, Oxfam said that even if all uh, other emissions were reduced uh, to zero today, if the rich 10% continued emitting at today's place, they would use the whole 1.5 degree carbon budget by 2022. So it is clear that there is a matter of unequal distribution here. In addition to this impact on the climate emergency, consumption is a critical public health and well-being issue. And we can relate to this. All supported cities are home to some residents who do not have enough for health and for living. Meanwhile, many cities also contend with the public health impact of overconsumption. 
such as lifestyle diseases, and increased pollution from space and private transportation, waste, etc. So this is why we must make our cities more equitable, more easy, and more climate conscious and resilient. And why it is so important we consider economic and demographic in our city. And finally, we catalyze ways to shift those factors to lower their climate. Last year, the Hot School Institute released a report that outlined the concept of fair space. They define this as a middle space in which size with an equitable share of resources and opportunities for people to fulfill the need and the achievement. The space around it uh, here is a divide or flow, leaving people vulnerable. This is our city. Much continue to make space and connect any city of the world. Easier with language Now to the future. The mission generated by our urban construction plan and extend twelve years city. This is the mission. The city can take long. More than we can in the we must work in partnership Thank you, Mayor Giuseppe of Milan. Um, sorry about the audio issues. My name is Julia Lipton, and I'm just going to finish his words for you. Um, so now to the future. Emissions generated by our, our urban consumption patterns extend well beyond city borders. These are not emissions that the city can take alone. We, and we can't simply regulate them either. We must work in partnership with community and business leaders to reduce inequality and change our social norms to value and achieve better, healthier, and more equitable living. With initial support from American Express, C40 is ramping up our work on fair and responsible consumption-based emissions. Um, and each city needs to um, have a plan for at least two sectors in accordance with C40's membership standards. Mayor Sala was invited to serve as C40's first vice chair for consumption-based emissions, and he is honored to lead this innovative new area of work to support cities in addressing consumption for immediate and deep emissions reductions across all sectors. I welcome you to this session where we will dig into these issues with several C40, issues, C C40 cities and partners, as well as two wonderful youth leaders and I also welcome you to join us in this work. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, and, and thank you for, for, for helping us with the message of Mayor Salas.
to avoid climate breakdown, cities more cut emissions by two thirds over the next decade, including those driven by urban demand. Our next panel will explore how cities can improve social and ecological well-being by implementing policies that reduce consumption and achieve climate justice. So please welcome here in the stage, C4E Global Youth and Mayor Forum member from Limerick, Ireland, Sorsha Exton, El Alcalde de la Ciudad de Miami, el Señor Francis Suárez, C4E Global Youth and Mayor Forum member from Calcutta, India, Ayakita Duta, Mayor of Rotterdam, Ahmed Abu Talef, and our moderator, Creative Director of Project Everyone, Hannah Cameron. Muchas gracias, bienvenidos. Good morning, everyone. Buen día para todos. I'm delighted to be here to moderate this discussion on climate justice through fair consumption. I'm the creative director at a London-based communications agency called Project Everyone. Our work is focused on the UN's Sustainable Development Goals, which I'm proudly wearing on my t-shirt. Goal 12 is responsible consumption and production. So I'm particularly keen to hear from the panelists this morning on how they think this critical goal can be achieved in a fair and equitable way. We've already heard from Mayor Sala about the reasons why we must act now to reduce methane and consumption-based emissions. What I hope this conversation will do is shed light on how. How city leaders can work more collaboratively with civic and business leadership across generations and across cultures uh, to achieve the climate goals. So, Without further ado, let's start our conversation. I, I don't need to reintroduce you, um, but I'll come first to you, uh, Mayor Abu Taleb. Um, you innovated a collaborative approach to climate action planning that engaged multiple partners when you issued your Rotterdam Climate Agreement. Can you tell us uh, a bit about how that agreement addressed consumption and developed the circular economy in Rotterdam? and also how it's now enabling the city to lead on climate action beyond your direct jurisdictional authority. Well, thank you very much. Um, it took a year uh, for the city to negotiate a, um, uh, an outcome with the business community, but also with the consumers organizations in the city uh, to uh, have a, a deal on, on, on climate. So it's a huge thing. We had about 12 tables um, for negotiations. and. Um, to give you um, um, uh, a couple of examples, uh, one of the things that we um, introduced is um, um, that um, uh, uh, if you go to a grocery shop and you um, buy stuff over there um, and you get a plastic bag, you have to pay for it. There is no free plastic bag at all in, in, the, in the supermarket. Yes. And the philosophy is that people take their own um, uh, stuff to collect mm -hmm. your uh, uh, shop in, 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 in the grocery. That's reducing plastics tremendously. The other one is to put also price on plastic bottles. Um, you have to bring your plastic bottle back to the supermarket to get um, the money you paid for it. It's about 25 cents per bottle. It's mm -hmm. really, um, psych psychologically, it's, it's, it has an effect on, on the way you reduce consumption. There was a, a, a national campaign, not only the city, to reduce the, uh, the time you are under the shower. So we um, introduced three minutes. And I don't know whether you uh, take a shower three minutes. I can tell you, you can do it. <laughs> uh, I was traveling through Africa and I did my shower with three bottles of three liters of water. You can do it, including shampoo in your hair. <laughs> you can do it, try it. There's try a it. challenge. Try it. And you can put a clock in your shower to follow three minutes and to see that it's, uh, it's working. Uh, but the, most, the, the, the most important saving that we have in consumption is the energy consumption. Mm -hmm. uh, we reduced the energy consumption nationwide in the city of Rotterdam, the same example, with 25%. Wow. Use of gas and electricity. And that's not only because, uh, unfortunately, not because we are campaigning and advocating that, but the war in Ukraine and the prices of energy play a role in, in this big saving, which is really um, a fascinating um, uh, development, that people are aware that there is a price to pay for the war. And if you um, consume more energy, then you sponsor Mr. Putin. That's what you do. Right. Um, and um, uh, I follow my, personally my own energy consumption home <coughs> through an app. 
And I um, can see every day what my energy consumption is, and I succeeded myself to reduce my energy consumption uh, since February of the year with two thirds. So it's a wow. tremendous contribution to the energy consumption, but also to um, uh, when it comes to the, the spending. Yeah. So it requires not only negotiations, but also a big awareness among citizens um, to be aware that it's really important to, to act um, responsibly the way we do. Yeah. Brilliant. And I know that Rotterdam is also home to one of the largest ports uh, in the world, yeah. um, and therefore you may be more aware than other cities of the massive impact of consumption on global emissions. Can you tell us a bit about how the, the, the port is reducing emissions and how the city and the port work together? Is there any lessons to I learn? don't have a, a nice story. The, the port of Rotterdam was, uh, until 10 years ago, responsible for 20% of the pollution in the Netherlands. 20%. Wow. Um, a large port, it's responsible for 500 million consumers in Europe. It's not only a Rotterdam port, it's in fact a European port. Uh, we know that the energy transition will take 30 years. We cannot wait until that energy transition is finished to reduce the pollution and the CO2 emissions and the NOx emissions in the port. So we're now under construction a huge pipeline, a public construction, connecting 40 kilometers of the port with 40 kilometers in the North Sea uh, to store the CO2 emissions that we collect from the companies in the port, mainly refineries. We have five major refineries serving the world in, from Rotterdam to collect the CO2 emissions, pump them as a liquid to the North Sea and store them in former oil and gas fields in the North Sea. That will reduce um, the amount of CO2 emissions in the Netherlands with 12 million tons. A huge number. Wow. The work will be finished, as my prediction, in 26. Okay. Well, that sounds phenomenal, and congratulations. Yeah. And it's a big investment with contribution of the European Union. Thank you, Brussels, <laughs> and, and also the national government. Yeah. And, and a great example of collaboration and, and, and how that can lead to a sense of shared yeah. ownership and responsibility yeah. for, for the, these outcomes. The decision is that we connect the pipeline also with the industry in Germany. Yeah. Uh, one of the most, most polluters in Europe is North Rhine-Westphalia with the uh, steel and car industry and also with in the south to the port of uh, Antwerpen to Belgium. So the idea is that the pipeline will serve Northwest Europe. Okay. Well, I think that is a brilliant example of united in action. Right. Um, united in action. That's, yeah. that's the word. Um, so, okay. Thank you. Um, Building on that theme then of collaborative working, Ayantika, I, I come to you um, in my research on you. I've read that you describe yourself as a sustainability evangelist. I love that <laughs> term. Um, you're doing a huge amount, not just to demystify the subject of climate change, but also to positively engage your peers in the challenge. Can you tell us about some of your experiences working with city leaders and <coughs> other clients, public agencies, um, to bring about the change yeah. that we need? Thank you so much for the question, Hannah. Um, um, so please don't mind me, I have a notebook. I usually have a habit of writing down the points and talking from there. And to also answer your question, I would first like to set the context sure. and then you know, probably answer your, please. the question. So you know, what we are talking about in this entire conference or this summit or even in this panel is about the paradigm shift, right? And the seed for this paradigm shift was planted when you know, climate change was first talked about in the 1800s. Well, of course, that is in the past, but what links the past to the future is today. And today, almost 3% of the world's population is the youth, and we are ready to take the responsibility of creating sustainable societies, but we are the ones often taken for granted. Why not, you know, create or just let all C40 cities mandatorily have youth councils at a city level? And I repeat, mandatorily have youth councils at a city level, where youth, businesses, and the mayors work together with the strength that the youth can provide, the synergies that the youth can provide, the diplomatic relations and other expertise that the government can provide, you know, and the businesses can provide, and the executional power that all the three segments can provide. Now, you know, this idea might sound a little foreign to some of them, but if we're talking about youth to power and it sounds foreign to us now, I'm sorry, we have the co entire concept of paradigm shift wrong, right? Mm -hmm. So 
We are, like Sir David King was mentioning yesterday, we have already tipped 1.3 degrees Celsius. Where are we now after that, right? Today, it is all about the choices that we make to act because the solutions are already present there. And what is the ask for here? The ask for here is to create better, economically stable, environmentally sound, sustainable societies, right? And you know what, let me break it down for you because uh, these jargons somehow so sometimes get us confused. So what we are asking for is to focus on societies, right, to the people. Now, I believe if we are able to keep people at the center of our decision making, it's so much easier to empathize with other people and take decisions accordingly. For example, you know, if we say, okay, you know, we should uh, take measures uh, because the ice is melting. I mean, we should, but if we are able to resonate it as why, what will happen, right, if the ice melts? Because, you know, the cities are gonna drown, then there's gonna be economic crisis, so on and so forth, and we can resonate with it more, right? Yeah. And this is the reason I say that social sustainability should be the focus because in order to achieve that, we need to keep economic growth and environmental growth, uh, conservation, protection at, the, at its core, right? Now, through my startup, uh, Climate B Ventures, we are actually reaching out to cities where we are prioritizing social sustainability and providing software solution for climate risk adaptation and mitigation, where you know we'll be helping the cities to uh, channelize funds properly and come up with uh, adaptation technologies. Now, to what you asked me uh, yes. about my experience, so cities have been quite receptive about it, but, uh, you know, I was once talking to this person, uh, one of the officials, and uh, that person told me, hey, but the monsoon is over and we're not having flooding anymore. I was like, uh, but is it not that it's a recurring thing and you are already facing erratic flooding in your area, right? So this actually brings me to my next point, which is, uh, you know, there is lack of awareness among people, right? So to be able to, uh, you know, achieve climate justice through fair consumption, which is the topic of the panel mm -hmm. today, it is really important that people are conscious and fair consumption only makes sense if people are conscious, right? So, uh, you know, and, what happens is often the uh, efforts that are being taken to uh, achieve fair consumption, it, it stays at this level, say for example, the summit, or you know, it goes to YouTube, Twitter, et cetera, and it does not reach to the people it should, which is, that, uh, which is the people at the uh, bottom level, right? Yeah. To the common people. So we need the media people as well to uh, be able to talk about it at the grassroots level where, um, you know, they're talking about it in their local languages, right? Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm actually doing what I can uh, through my uh, podcast, Sustainability Under Microscope, mm -hmm. where, you know, I t try to bring out what businesses are doing to uh, mitigate and adapt to the climate crisis. Brilliant. But I think we all need to work together in this because, you know, the mayors are doing a lot on their individual level. The uh, youth are doing uh, everything that they can at the individual level, but it's time that we really time work to come together. Bring so, that together. Yeah, this well, decade is for action. Let's, to stay within 1.5 degrees Celsius, we require bold and, you know, educated risk. The youth is ready to take, lead the way, to be the enablers yeah. of the collaboration. Together we can and let's unite in this action. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. What, what a lot of very strong points um, and the need for meaningful engagement of youth and a, and a great idea there for C40 Cities. I'll let, I'll let you take that away. Um, Mayor Suarez, let me come to you. Uh, as someone who works in creative communications, I'm a big fan of the way you've used uh, language and narrative to change the image of Miami. Um, I know that you've, uh, to use your own words, you've tried to change it from a fun and sun place to vacation and retire to a hub for technology innovation. You also released a comprehensive update to the city's climate action plan last year. Can you tell us a bit about these areas of focus and how perhaps by shifting the city's mindset, um, you can shape the future and the, the legacy of Miami. Thank you. Uh, first, I've learned a lot in the 13 years that I've had the privilege of, of serving uh, the public. Uh, one of the things I've learned is your communication matters, right? Uh, the mayor and I were talking backstage about storytelling and understanding how to, how to create the narrative and change the narrative, but emphasis matters. The words you emphasize, the words you choose matter. They set the tone. 
And so one of the things that we like to say in Miami is that the environment is the economy, right? There's this idea that the environment and the economy are juxtaposed one against the other, right? You have to choose one or choose the other. And for us, uh, a city that is, um, you know, that has on the west side the Everglades, which is this incredibly beautiful, one of the almost like a natural wonder of the world, uh, which provides our drinking water. And then on the on the coast side, we have uh, we have our coral reef system, which is provides billions of dollars in ecotourism, and it's something that, you know, for generations people have enjoyed, and we hope to preserve for generations into the future. You realize that the economy is is part of who we are it's part of uh, what we are and so uh, you know protecting it it's it's not it, it, it's a false choice to say that you have to either choose one thing or the other uh, in miami we've tried to distinguish ourselves in in the three main areas of course uh, in terms of adaptation uh, our residents voted to tax themselves in the miami forever plan so we're spending $200 million, which we hope to leverage with money from the state. We got $50 million this year. Hopefully, we'll get more in the next legislative session. And, of course, the infrastructure bill, which is a, a trillion, uh, $200 billion. So we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully continue to reinforce ourselves because what we've seen with Hurricane Ian and Hurricane Dorian, the last two hurricanes that have either hit Florida or come close to it, is devastating storm surge. Uh, on, the, uh, on the mitigation front, obviously, we're a member of C40 and believe in carbon neutrality. And I think one of the things that's important is we are working with external stakeholders, not just the government, uh, but our, our power company, right, which um, uh, has become the largest solar uh, provider or purveyor of solar in the country. And so they've gotten the message and they have a clean energy plan by 2045. So you need your partners uh, to help. And then the third bucket, I would say, is what I would call uh, technology or sort of climate tech, right? What are we doing to mitigate or reduce the impacts of our of, of human interaction? You know, um, I've seen some great technologies and some great uh, ideas on how we can reduce uh, carbon emissions uh, in our in our environment. And so, uh, you know, supporting electric vehicles, doing a variety of different things that we can do as a city to support things that are going to get us closer and closer to. Uh, carbon neutrality and or carbon positivity and or reversal, what I, what I like to call reversal. You know, we spend a lot of time talking about mitigation, which is to not make worse, yeah. right? But I, I think we have to spend a little bit more time talking about how do we reverse? Right. How do we reverse right. the impacts of some of the things that have, been, that have happened in our world? Thank you so much. I think, yeah, this, this positive spin of turning it away from something that feels Absolutely. like we have to make sacrifices to actually this is an extraordinary opportunity for us to live with abundance, live with more. And I think coming to you now, Saoirse, on this, you know, um, Mayor Suarez talking there about language and how language can lead to a mind shift and a different uh, understanding of ourselves. Um, I know that you have a particular interest in kind of the behavioral aspect of climate change. And we've had some brilliant conversations in preparation for this about how culture and language can help reconnect people to the planet and ecosystems. I'd, I'd love to hear from you about that aspect that really transcends city borders, um, your, your views on how art, how culture, can shift our politics and our policies forward? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, in Ireland, we have a native language which um, has been there for at least 8,000 years in, in some form or another. And so, you know, the language inherently is, is incredibly connected to the land. Um, we were just talking about this, but, you know, if English, for example, linguistically speaking, is a language that objectifies things. It looks at the object and not, so for example, a tree, it doesn't uh, think about the relationship that that tree has to the world around it. Whereas in a lot of indigenous languages, like Irish, for example, look at the relationship between um, individual objects and the environment and system they exist within. So in Ireland, we have uh, 32 words for a field because um, you know all of these different uses for that field and um, were highlighted by these words so I, I really think and and it's it's a, a, it's you know a, a growing movement in Ireland um, 
that you know by by connecting with indigenous languages whether it's our own ones or whether it's the ones that are present in the land that we are on uh, we can really begin to understand the context of the land and not just see it as a resource um, but as you know a living thing which is what it is um, so I, I I think language is is a vital element um, of creating this new system that, that we need to come together to to create um, I think, honestly, that our economic system is fundamentally broken. I think it is completely irretrievably broken because it is based fundamentally on growth. It is based on um, growth without any regard for the planet. Um, and I think we cannot, we cannot achieve climate action. We cannot achieve climate justice unless somehow we create a new economic system, a new social system. We, it is impossible because this system that we live in now was founded in exploitation. It was founded in the suffering of people that, that we, or those in the global north anyway, saw as lesser than us. Um, so I think, you know, what we really need to be saying is we cannot just be thinking about, you know, um, new ways of producing energy or, um, or you know, all of these things that, that are brilliant. We need to be thinking of new ways of doing and thinking entirely because we just, we cannot live, we cannot live in this system. Um, we, we cannot exist in this system. Okay, yeah. well, that's, yes, could I? No, just one remark. This is really, really fundamental what you say. Um, I'm now 20 years working in, in, in government, national and local government. And um, it will not be easy to change systems. Why? Because the ones that have the systems have the benefits of the system. And we're talking about consumers today, and that's where the power is. The ones that have systems in their own hands will never do that. i give one example. We had an issue with um, producers of chicken meat that was not produced eco-friendly. And it was very cheap in supermarkets. And suddenly there was a movement among consumers, we don't want it. We don't want it, we don't buy it. You put it in the supermarket, but we don't buy it. And within a couple of years, it disappears from the supermarket. It's not there anymore. Um, that is the purchase power of citizens. So don't, uh, in my opinion, I will not put a lot of energy in trying to convince the ones that are the power in the systems to change the system. They will never do it. Right. But the ones that have the power to do it are the consumers. Are the consumers. So it brings us back to this. It's a value shift that uh, every, we need everyone to come on. And it seems that all of you are sharing different ways that we can bring about that value shift. I guess the kind of you know, whether it's through engaging technology, whether it's through tapping into the cultures and lexicon of our past to teach us lessons about our future, whether it's, you know, so do you, I guess my final question back to you all, and it has to be quick because we're on our last minute, is do you think then that value shift that ultimately moves away from profit at all costs to well-being at all costs within our planetary uh, allowance is is possible. Uh, unfortunately, I, uh, what I see in my dialogue with my citizens, even when I talk with them about the threat of breaking dikes, that Rotterdam is protected by a huge um, number of dikes and levees, even when I talk with them about the danger connecting with that and floodings and etc., uh, it's really difficult to convince people to change their behavior. Okay. But if we do what Mayor Suarez is saying, uh, convincing our citizens that is the new economy and uh, that moving to another system will be to the benefit of all if we do it just. That is, I think, the message we have to bring across. Convincing okay. people that the new economy is in the big change of thinking about how we consume and do things. Okay, very quickly, Mayor Suarez, would you like to say a final word? I agree. I think we're eighth in the nation in what they call green jobs, mm -hmm. uh, the city of Miami. We have 40,000 unfilled green jobs in Miami. If we fill those jobs, we're third in the nation. So to, to the mayor's point, um, it, it is about how you talk about these issues and how you contextualize them in a way that uh, invites people to be a part of this movement. Okay. 
Well, we are, we are at time, so thank you so much. Thank you to C40 Cities, to the City of Buenos Aires, to all of you for joining. Um, I've learned a lot. It, uh, it seems complex, and it should be complex, but that shouldn't be a reason for us uh, to shy away. So keep going with United in Action, and um, yes, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to our panelists for sharing uh, their insights. Um, we received many responses on policy recommendations from different city residents around the world. Many have ideas on improving waste management and also reducing the impact of consumption. So Helen from Nairobi would like to see garbage sorted and disposed in the right way. While Calcutta resident Sarwesh wants us to reduce the demands of consumerism. All great ideas, and I just encourage you to just keep them coming. Next up, we have a fireside chat focused on pathways towards zero waste. So please give a warm welcome to Chief Executive Officer of the Global Methane Hub, Marcelo Mena, and Executive Mayor of Ekurhu Leni, Tania Campbell. Welcome. Great, thank you. So thank you for joining us in this uh, fireside uh, chat, um, hopefully not with any wood or gas or coal, because all cities' major contributors of pollution are the way that we heat. Um, I just wanted to talk to you briefly about methane and why it's important and why we're working through C40 uh, to support uh, cities in reducing methane emissions. It's going to make or break our capacity to meet 1.5 degrees. And if what we do this decade on methane mitigation could actually be uh, three times as fast as reducing temperature. We could actually reduce temperature 0.3 degrees by 2040 if we act on this. We could actually measure progress from space. We could keep track of what we're doing. We could hold those who emit accountable. And self-reporting will not be sufficient. So you could talk to an oil and gas industry, they could say they're not leaking, we're gonna see those leaks, the same way that we saw in the Nord Stream leak recently. But one thing that's important that is recently, we saw that some of the largest point sources of methane globally are landfills. Buenos Aires, 50% of all its methane emissions are in one point, it's a landfill. Uh, Delhi, 6%, and Mumbai, 26%. So we could actually reduce those landfills and look at how they improve and operate. So I'm here with Tanya Campbell from Ekerulini, and you recently uh, signed your Pathway to Zero Waste uh, initiative, and that's great, it's something that C40 is leading. I just wanted to ask you how, um, what you're doing uh, to reduce food waste and how you're improving waste disposal in your city. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, in, in our city, Nikurulini, we've got the 2030 uh, targeted action plan. Um, this is uh, to get our targets in, in line for zero uh, waste and uh, zero... Um, you know, we need to, we need to start uh, uh, separating also by source. Uh, we find that if we do not do that, we are heading into where our landfill sites will be overused. Um, we cannot sit in those situations. But also, our city aims to achieve a 50% solid waste um, stream prior to disposal. Um, yesterday, we were sitting in a plenary, and one of the comments that was made was, why is it not separated and chucked into the, the trucks itself. Now, we do sit in a specialized or a special situation in South Africa where we do have uh, waste pickers who come through to our houses. So to get them into a situation or co-ops and train them within our, our uh, training hubs that we have formed, 
that is the way to go. Education and educating our, our population on how to actually manage this. Um, I think that is something our action plan is set to assist in achieving over 23% of our reduction in uh, carbon. So, you know, our plans are set for us. We are on target so far. Um, and uh, as I said, if you do not start planning uh, and start setting your targets and start achieving, even if it is one step at a time, um, you are not going to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so to provide a little bit more background, which is really important, when we think about intensive emissions, we think about, for example, in my country, Chile, copper generates one kilo, uh, three kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of copper, and which we know is very intense. We do a lot of effort. But when we don't compost our uh, organic waste, mm. it's the same ratio three kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of organic waste. So the things that we could do domestically to reduce this, actually, it can be actually more important than many other things that we overlook. So I think it's really important that we, we manage this and also the, create the capacity. Yes. So you were telling me, uh, you know, yesterday we had a conversation about the waste pickers, of course, because, you know, they, they are under the threat of, 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 you know, life threat sometimes, you know, the, these landfills collapse and they uh, impact them negatively. Now, um, can you tell me a little bit more uh, how you've been working with the private sector to actually build that capacity? Because obviously, uh, when you have a, a Unilever that has a global target of net, a zero waste to landfill, they need to meet that and prove that that's true. So how, how yeah. have you been working with the private sector and what do you see their role in that? Yeah, uh, with the private sector, it's, uh, we have had discussions with uh, many private sectors to assist with uh, programs of training um, to help with the uh, waste pickers to make them into co-ops. Um, and when they are co-ops as well, that then gives us the um, ability to employ them on or pay them uh, some or other fee. So it's job creation in our, in our green environment. It's green jobs for them as well. Um, we have had a management plan and have got one uh, with minimizing waste with uh, the business uh, management training with Oxfam as well. Um, that is very successful. Uh, we have had 20 separate uh, waste picker sections where we are doing pilot projects with them, uh, training them how to manage it, training them what needs to be done, how um, to run their little corporate as well. Um, it is important to do that. Uh, what I did uh, like from our discussion yesterday uh, with you is when you said you could highlight uh, via satellite which um, uh, waste disposal areas are high toxin in methane. Now that also shifts your focus because you, you um, are concentrating on what you are uh, seeing on the ground, but with what your technology or your information does, it then centers us to say, these are the areas that we need to confirm and these are the areas that we need to work with more. Um, bringing in public-private partnerships with us, uh, helping with disposals, um, with specialized disposals as well. Mm -hmm. So yes, because ma many times we understand that mayors have a, a mandate that's underfunded and also are uh, expected to manage waste well, but the accumulation of methane gas has caused many landfill fires that actually take hold of your agenda if they ever mm. exist. And so odor control issues and an increasing awareness from the citizens is that just, just, they just don't want to be exposed to this uh, pollution anymore. And of course, we've seen that landfills are usually sited near lower income communities. So when we're actually doing this work, we're actually improving the, their livelihoods and actually uh, facing environmental justice uh, head on. So I, yeah, with that, um, so to clarify, so the Methane Hub, SRON, uh, GHD SAT, Carbon Mapper, multiple different platforms, IMEO, we're gonna make available the leaks of multiple landfills and we're working with 20 uh, initially uh, cities to face this. And so many times this will allow you to prevent reduction of emissions around 90% right away. So for example, if a mayor has a major emitter and they want to meet a really big reduction, they could actually make and actually prove it 
right away, not next year with some bottom-up inventory, but actually know exactly what the reductions will be. So we hope to work together with Ekerulini on that also. I just want to also mention that many times mayors can lead the charge and push national governments. And when I was a uh, minister, many municipalities were banning plastic bags with not a lot of legal mandate, but they started to, to, to do it and we gave them the authority to actually do it on national. Then of course they continued with single use plastics mm. and now we have a single use plastic bag. I think now uh, the, or the banning the organic waste from being landfilled is really important. It's a really easy, low-hanging fruit. It'll extend the lifetime of your landfill. You won't have to be looking where to put your trash anymore, and you could actually contribute to a circular economy. So what do you think about that, uh, Mayor? Yes, uh, I think it's fantastic, and this is where we can bring policy into our local municipalities and our cities. Um, we have got a platform where we can do bylaws, and those bylaws are when we create our policies. Um, you know, uh, this is also when composting then um, has an advantage because if you go away from plastic, your composting sites then can also be a um, advantage to you. But I do agree with you. That is something that we as mayors can push very hard. And with the businesses around us, a lot of us have got retail businesses um, that are localized um, and are not regulated by their big head offices. And we can start implementing these programs through, through businesses and retailers within our areas. Um, I do know that a lot of the uh, businesses in our city have got uh, what we call social responsibilities, and that's one of the first things when I have a meeting with them is to say, what is your social responsibility? What is your responsibility in our ecosystem? Um, so for me to be able to develop a policy surrounding that would be really something and a good achievement for us to reach our targets. Mm -hmm. And I also think that many of these companies that have net zero targets, uh, they should also accompany it with zero pollution and, of course, zero waste to landfill because they are contributing many times to a problem uh, they choose to ignore. Uh, so any last, uh, any last comments, uh, Mayor, on yes. what you hope to achieve with us and how we could also have find new partners to collaborate? Yes, I, I do feel, um, you know, as mayors, I've, I've heard people say that mayors are powerless. Mayors aren't powerless. I do feel that we have got our own platforms. Like I know in our country, we've got bylaws. We can set policies. We can set policies to policies that will make us uh, reach our targets, uh, our awareness programs. Um, and within our city, we are very active in setting our programs, um, but bringing in the youth into these programs. Um, I had very successful meetings with uh, organization and looking at how to bring our youth within these programs because a lot of times um, it is my generation or older generations who still need to do that paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we use our youth to start uh, educating them and start running with these programs, we have got a winning recipe. Mm -hmm. True. Uh, in my case, though, it's me that compost. I got to convince my, child, my children to, to join us in this. And it's really important. Just one last number on that. Uh, home that actually compost, uh, actually the reductions of emissions can actually be bigger than leaving your car at home. So I think you, you must do the math. We must, must acknowledge that short-term warming that this contributes to. And so therefore, composting, reducing organic waste, zero uh, waste to landfill are the ways forward. Thank you very much for your time. And I'll see Thank you. Next you. Time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And now we're going to take a very small break. Time for coffee and some alfajores or pastelitos. Uh, before our next thematic session that is going to be focused on shaping the future of green finance in cities. So I will see you all back here at 10.15.
Welcome back to the steep. Please welcome back to the stage your Master of Ceremonies for the C40 World Mayor's Summit, Vanessa Hauk. So to the C40 cities, we start with a second theme of today, future of climate financing for cities. Very important indeed. And to start this session, it is a pleasure to invite to this stage the Director of Sustainability and uh, Finances of the IFC, Mr. Ignacio de Calonge. Thank you very much. I am so pleased to be here in Buenos Aires pleasure and honor to be here. So uh, there's been a lot of fantastic uh, mayors and political leaders that have spoken brilliantly uh, at this event uh, and really describing the environmental and social challenges in their, in their cities. Uh, they have inspired us with tales of innovation and resilience. But I am a humble financier, so you will forgive me if my speech is less eloquent than theirs. I'm here to talk to you about sustainable finance. Uh, and I'm also here to talk to you uh, and tell you that finance is no longer just finance. As you may know, sustainable finance market uh, is on fire, has been booming lately. The annual amount of green, social, sustainability and sustainability linked loans and bonds has gone from a is global issuance of about $150 billion a year in, two th in 2016 to over $1.7 trillion last year. Um, and uh, you, for those mathematicians in the room, you will realize that uh, you already calculate that's about a 12-fold increase in just five years. And in places like Europe, about 30% of all investment grade uh, bond issuances are sustainable uh, debt instruments. Now, it's true that the current uh, economic and geopolitical climate, uh, global debt issuances uh, has, has gone down including that of sustainable finance instruments. But I think it's fair to say that the growth has been quite remarkable over the last few years, and we can only expect it to continue. Cities and regions across the world uh, have been tapping into this market. Uh, since 2015, uh, cities and regions have issued approximately $215 billion of sustainable finance debt instruments. And that includes many of the largest cities in Europe, North America, Japan, and we're talking uh, cities like Madrid, Paris, Los Angeles, Tokyo, etc. Cities in emerging markets, however, have some catching up to do. Um, they only represent about 1% of the sub-regional sustainable finance debt market. Um, having said that, there are a number of cities in emerging markets that have done and used these types of instruments. Uh, Cape Town and Johannesburg, for example, in South Africa. Uh, Ghaziabad in India last year was the first Indian municipality to issue a green bond. And in Latin America, Mexico City is a good example of uh, a city that has issued both green and sustainability bonds. But the reality is uh, emerging market cities have still um, uh, some scope to, to do more in, in this area. But you might say, well, why? Why should they? Why should they be interested in the stable finance market? What, what's in it for them? And I think the reality is there are more and more pools of capital that are either exclusively focused on these types of instruments or that have ESG criteria that strongly incentivize them to invest uh, in these types of instruments. And as a result of that high demand from investors, there's increasing evidence that when issuers issue these instruments, they achieve higher levels of oversubscription 
in those bond issuances and therefore better pricing for the issuer. But I think more significantly than the pricing advantage, these instruments really allow cities, regions to communicate their sustainability journey to, to investors, tap into a larger investor pool, tap into a longer term investor pool, and have a different level of dialogue with their invest investors and a different level of engagement. This is a market that is also evolving quickly. Uh, I think sustainability links bonds and loans are a good example of innovation. I think most of you know that sustainability linked loans and bonds are those that where the interest rate can go up or down depending if the uh, issuer has achieved certain sustainability uh, targets. And three or four years ago, these, these instruments were virtually, virtually inexistent. Uh, and now, they represent about a third of the total sustainable debt market. Um, and these instruments have been mainly used by corporates. Uh, they were the first ones to, to start issuing these instruments. But the first city um, uh, issued a sustainability link bond earlier this year, Helsingborg in Sweden in January, uh, issued a sustainability link bond which was linked to their targets in terms of reduction of GHG uh, emissions. And if they don't uh, meet those targets, there will be an impact on their interest rate. And a number of cities have followed since. And what we think the beauty of these new instruments, sustainability linked loans and bonds, the beauty of them is they link the long term, the medium and long term sustainability strategy of a city, of a corporate, uh, to the financing. Uh, and they can choose typically one to four KPIs, and those can be climate KPIs, they can be social KPIs. Uh, and we're really excited at IFC is how we can uh, look at these instruments in the city space. We're already very active in the corporate space, uh, but uh, both regions and municipalities, uh, we think, have a great scope. But we also want to say that stable finance shouldn't be done in a vacuum. There is a risk of greenwashing. And increasingly, multilaterals and other investors, such as IFC, uh, want to use these financing to engage in a strategic dialogue with our partners and help them along their sustainability journey. We've done that, for example, with Sao Paulo, where we've helped to reduce water losses uh, and advise them there. We're working with Izmir in Turkey around gender programs and many others. So really, I would say that the world of sustainable finance is growing, it's innovating. Investors are increasingly gravitating towards these instruments uh, that really fully integrate financing and sustainability. So, I won't ask for your vote after this speech. I am no politician. But I would ask you to explore these growing and exciting financial instruments and consider them for your city or region. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias al señor Ignacio de Calonge. And now, in our next panel, C40 mayors and finance partners will share impactful stories on how to finance a green and just transition. So, please welcome to the stage CEO of the London Pension Fund Authority, Robert Brannan, Managing Director of Global Partnerships, CDPQ, Rebecca Manuel, Mayor of Curitiba, Rafael Greca, the Mayor of Austin, Steve Adler, and our moderator, Andy Deacon, co-managing director at the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy. Bienvenidos.
Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, discussion panel. Uh, and I'm going to turn immediately to uh, questions to our two mayors. We heard from our keynote speaker about potential investment opportunities in cities that can deliver a just and sustainable future. So let's hear first from the cities of Austin and Curitiba how they are taking advantages, advantage of those opportunities. First, maybe I turn to you, Mayor Adler. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. We appreciate the, the opportunity. Um, I think everyone is trying to figure out how to bring resources to the community benefits and to the climate benefits uh, we're driving. And I think where we're being most successful in Austin is where we find the intersection between the, the, the climate change goals and responsibilities uh, with, with other uh, goals in the community. Uh, so as we bring in more and more partners, I think the best example for us right now is uh, we just had our community go to the polls in the middle of the pandemic and vote to increase their property taxes by 20% in order to bring to Austin a public mass transit system. This is after almost two and a half decades of failed uh, movements. For us uh, to meet our climate change obligations, transportation is our second biggest opportunity area after power generation. Uh, but to be able to give people choices, mobility choices, so that in, as in Texas, where people love their big cars, uh, we, we live in a city where 71% of the people commute to our downtown uh, alone in their cars. So we've never really provided that, that mobility choice, but we are now. But by having a project like that, and it's probably a $15 billion project, we're able to not only build something which meets our climate change needs, uh, but also prevents a lot of finance and funding opportunities for public-private participation because we're changing the face of our city. So as part of the $15 billion is a $300 million line item that the government's put in to help promote uh, affordable housing and to prevent uh, dislocation of people near transit-oriented stations. But we're also using that transit system and those stations in order to create public-private partnerships for people that want to invest in the, 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 the real estate plays that, that, that would exist. Uh, and that's bringing in dollars and, and changing the areas. It's helping us drive our equity goals uh, in, the, in the city. Uh, we divide, designed that system in a way where uh, uh, there's a station within walking distance of 70% of the affordable housing in our community, also driving investment uh, opportunities. Uh, so, so we're trying to push those. We're also using our land development code in order to, to incent uh, property owners along transit corridors to, to build bigger and more densely and to bring more people. Uh, not by offering dollars, but by offering development entitlements and opportunities that didn't otherwise uh, uh, exist. Uh, and because it's something that is going to be such a large project for our city, it opens up a huge opportunity for us to take people in our community that are not full participants in our workforce uh, and create the, the middle skill jobs in skilled labor uh, training opportunities. Uh, and that brings its, its, its own source of, of funding and resources to projects. Great. Thank you so much for setting those opportunities out uh, very clearly. To you, uh, Mayor Greca, the similar question. How is Curitiba uh, taking advantage of these investment opportunities? I would like to greet everybody here at the table. The current projects in Curitiba are with different types of agreements with international uh, loans. These international loans, in other words, these specific contracts, I insist international loans are 100% used to reach 
the goals that lead Curitiba to carbon neutrality in 2050. We have a climate plan that we really hope uh, will take place in 2030, and we hope to reach 33% of decarbonization precisely to reach the goals by 2050. In Curitiba, we have $281 million or 1.5 billion reales for sustainable um, issues and climate risk. And so Curitiba is a city of the VTRs. That is to say, that is there is uh, where we created the bus system with exclusive corridors so that the different types of 1.5, um, 1,500 buses can actually flow. We have a lot of corridors that are exclusive. The next uh, stage is to decarbonize the fleet, to take away the VRTs that work on diesel and use the electric ones. That is why we have this need to find allies to create alliances in this great and huge task. I will be doing the first transportation belt in by 2024 uh, with electric buses that would see to 28 neighborhoods. But we have 75 neighborhoods in all, and there are two important corridors, mass transportation-wise. I will need, then, to leave a legacy for the up next mayor for the city to improve more and more. We do have a project. This is a water uh, reserve. It's a great lake in the swamps that make up the Iguazu River. It's the same river as the uh, Iguazu Falls. This great lake with 40 million liters of water is almost natural, I should say, a natural lake. And we will make it a water reserve area in case of great drought, for instance. So we do have a project to mitigate city emissions combining then the electromobility program in terms of public transportation with another program, which is solar pyramids, transportation terminals. We have 75 in all, all of them with solar roofs and solar energy. The whole municipality must have 60% of their energy costs that should come from the solar energy. Sun is free of charge. And what is interesting in this regard is the geographic location of Curitiba that is below the Tropic of Capricorn is a region of a lot of sun. So therefore, people said, well, in a cold uh, city, there is no solar energy. But I say to them, there are more possibilities of solar energy creation in Curitiba than there is in, in, in the, the, the day with the greatest sun in Germany. So that's the comparison I, I, I can make. So therefore, we want to move forward, and I am building and uh, rather contributing with 8,500 photovoltaic panels on, on what we would say on a special um, land uh, fill. And the truth is that we could, or a dump area rather, we could say that it is a solar camp, and until March, we will place 8,500 solar panels. So this will create 3.5 megawatts uh, in uh, power, and all my solar program will create 8 megawatts of uh, power, because we have to think about energy. and. We must think about energy before connecting, in other words, before connecting our appliances, before using it. So we have to think that it's important to know the source. Where does the energy come from to think about decarbonization? So this is what I can say as a contribution of my uh, beloved city of Curitiba. 
Thank you so much. And to turn now to uh, Robert Branner and to Rebecca Manuel. Uh, so cities need strong partnerships to be able to exploit the opportunities at their disposal, uh, as we've just heard. The summit's tagline is, after all, united in action. Can you both tell us about your journey as institutional investors? And specifically, how has your commitment to sustainable investment enabled both the London Pension Fund Authority and CDPQ to work closely with cities and other financial actors to develop these crucial partnerships? Robert, maybe to come to you first. Thank you, and delighted to be here representing a pension fund amongst all these esteemed guests. Because, of course, my, my main purpose is to pay pensions. That's why I'm, uh, that's why I'm there. That's what I do. Um, but, of course, we understand that how we invest is crucially important um, for our future, for the environment, and for our members. And those members span an awful lot of organizations, including charities, local government officials, universities, a, a large remit of, of uh, organizations and, and members who care deeply about climate change. In terms of climate change, uh, we have had a policy since 2017 which is completely separate to our RI and ESG policy. Um, we have recently published, uh, or we're about to publish our net zero plan because we made a commitment last year for 2050 and significant progress by 2030. But one of the areas that's come up quite often today already is on collaboration. And just if I may, there are three quick areas to share with colleagues on collaboration for us. One is obviously working with the mayor's office. We've worked closely with the mayor of London's office for a number of years now. Climate action is a significant um, objective and manifesto commitment from the mayor of London. Um, although my responsibility is to pay pensions, obviously we are aligned on lots of areas of, of climate action uh, alongside the mayor. Um, but I know that the climate risks, if I think of risk in a pension system, that impacts the ability for me to make returns and to actually generate pensions, not just for today, 10 years, 40 years, but 100 years time. So collaboration with the mayor and London leaders is, is fundamental. Second one is more widely uh, investing in London's um, future. So we've collaborated with a number of other investment managers to construct something which we call the London Fund. And that is uh, an investment vehicle to invest in the greater London area for doing two things. I still need a return, <laughs> you know, and right. I'm sorry to say it, but I still need to pay my pension, so I need to make a return on this, but also to do some good. So we invest in things like startup businesses, we, we invest in green um, uh, carbon neutral buildings, we regenerate some areas. I thought that we were doing quite well until yesterday in some of the sessions where I heard all the things that are happening in 15 minute cities on health. I've just gone, whoa, this is fantastic stuff and I'm just at the start point. But we do have things where we invest in London for Londoners, but also make a return for my pensioners as well. And then thirdly, we're, although in our equities and our stocks and shares, we invest globally, most of our infrastructure is done in the UK. So we invest in um, solar, in uh, wind, in uh, rolling stock, in ports, things like that. Um, so we spend a lot of time uh, looking at UK investments, but we collaborate with other pension funds or other investors to try and get scale. And it's the pooling of assets and getting scale which tends to make a difference in some of these activities. Great, thank you very much. And Rebecca, to turn to you. Sure, just also adding my thanks on behalf of CDBQ for uh, being able to join such an important conversation today. So just by way of quick introduction, um, CDBQ, we are a global investment manager, but we manage um, on behalf of the pensions of about 6 million citizens of Quebec. So we've got about 400 billion uh, Canadian under management. We actually have two uh, specific mandates, one which is to provide obviously uh, the required returns for underlying clients but also to support the economic development of Quebec. And as such, um, and also obviously over the long term, um, and as such, really we try and think about our capital um, as constructive capital. So when we think about investments, it's about investing in businesses that can help to build sustainable economies around them because obviously we want to be constructive both in terms of uh, where our money um, is being invested but also in terms of uh, delivering returns over the long term for our underlying depositors. 
In terms of a, our climate journey, um, similar to as Robert said, we also in 2017 first set out um, our overall climate um, uh, programs with specific targets because we thought that would enable us to really uh, focus and ensure delivery. Um, 2021, we actually took the opportunity to step back because we had exceeded many of those targets that we set in 2017, and we wanted to raise to increase our ambition further and to remain really at the forefront. So we put in place four specific goals. One, which was to increase our low carbon assets in our portfolio um, to 54 billion uh, by 2025. Uh, secondly, to reduce the carbon uh, footprint of our overall portfolio by 60% from the 2017 level by 2030. Uh, we created what we, we hope and believe is an innovative uh, $10 billion energy transition bucket, um, which is basically targeted to help companies who are heavy carbon emitters who are essential to the transition, go um, raise that capital that is needed for, to specifically help them on their decarbonization journey. And then finally, we undertook to exit oil production by the end of 2022. Um, and I would say that also for us, the, the drivers behind this are twofold. One, uh, obviously it's important to invest in sustainable businesses, but also secondly, we recognize it makes important business sense. And so what we've, we've seen is the actual results of um, over the last two years, frankly, we've created $6 billion of returns for our depositors from our renewables portfolio, and that's compared to the $1 billion that we would have created had we stayed in uh, keeping those invested, um, in assets invested in kind of fossil fuel heavy um, investments. So turning to, um, it turning into, uh, again, collaboration and how we work with cities. I mean, obviously cities, a uh, couple of things. Um, they're very essential to uh, many of the asset classes that we invested, particularly from an infrastructure, but also from a real estate and, and social perspective. Um, we, so we think about it both from an investment perspective and from uh, an overall collaboration. You know, the specific, a couple of specific examples that uh, we're very proud of, one which is the, um, uh, the REM in Montreal, which is a multi-billion dollar uh, light rail project. Um, in which we've been working with the province of Quebec and the city of Montreal uh, since 2016, when it first was on the planning stages, uh, to now when we're um, about ready to open up the first stations. Uh, we've created a, um, a subsidiary called CDBQ Infra, which works with uh, our, the various stakeholders from a building, all the way from a planning, financing, building, uh, operating perspective. Uh, to help bring those visions uh, to life. Uh, through many of our um, investments uh, in companies such as Kaolis, Plenary, um, Student Transportation Authority, you know, we work with many uh, cities and municipalities across the globe uh, to help them really uh, implement and execute their visions around uh, mobility and ensuring greener outcomes. And we also act from a collaboration perspective. So for example, in Montreal, uh, Montreal was recently chosen to be the host city for the International Sustainability Standard Board, um, which is, I think, the previous speaker was talking about, you know, there's a big risk around um, lack of standards and greenwashing as, you know, we start to really increase the amount of capital flowing to climate finance. So we're very, very pleased. I think part of the reason why Montreal was chosen as a host city was because of the deep commitment um, within the city from ourselves and from many of our other uh, partners within the city um, to sustainability and, you know, very excited about um, helping to see that uh, to fruition to the next phases. Thank you so much. Uh, and in our, our few remaining uh, minutes. <laughs> Uh, quickly to come back to you, Robert, how do we turn on the tap? How do we unleash uh, the financing flows that are needed to promote rapid and inclusive climate action? Yeah, so this is largely about pipeline opportunity for me. This is opportunities to, in to invest in, and there's three areas just to touch on briefly. Firstly, um, if I use the example of planning and wind farms, so we do a lot of investment in offshore wind farms. There's legislation that doesn't really encourage onshore wind farms, largely because MPs have constituents who don't like noise and have got issues with it. So there's been historically real issues about onshore wind farm development. Three weeks ago, the UK government announced that that restriction would be lifted. So as long as that remains in place when I get home tomorrow, 
<laughs> that is progress at a national level about moving some restrictions for, for onshore development. Uh, the second one is finance. Um, we've already, Rebecca's already touched on it as well about uh, raising capital and investing capital um, sustainably. Um, pension funds historically don't really like greenfield or brand new opportunities. We don't do development, we don't do um, building that well. You know, we we'll invest in things which gives us a return that we can use to pay pensions. So on the finance side, we do look to the mayor a lot more than say pension funds to do some support within London. And the mayor, for instance, has got like an energy efficiency fund, which provides flexible finance for small businesses. Um, they're going to issue a green, the, the mayor's going to issue a green bond to help some, some um, organizations, businesses that has an accelerator program about re retrofitting um, buildings um, and local energy. Um, so the mayor is picking up some of this challenge that say pension funds can't do on the bigger scale. And the third area is probably on skills. And again, yesterday and this morning have been fascinated around some of the community in C40 have got skills and attributes that you don't find in normally in one organization like a pension fund. Um, and connecting with, with colleagues here in the room around helping us get to investment grade opportunities is really important and colleagues in the room and colleagues within C40 can help do that. No, great, thank you. And uh, wonderful to hear how we are uniting in action. To come to you, Mayor Greca, same question. How do we uh, get the finance moving? How do we get the finance flowing? Well, a, a gestão da cidade é a sua, a sua, o bem comum do seu povo. The city is definitely a common asset for the population. So I think that first and foremost, we need to have fiscal balance. Cities cannot spend more than what they collect. That's uh, to begin with. And the, the question is, how does the budget of a city and also the budget of any government uh, at a federal level or at a provincial level, uh, how do they manage this? I think this reflects the fact that mayors need to take this into account. It's like a curse for Curitiba, because if you don't do it, it doesn't exist. We need to do it. We have to uh, have the willpower to do things and also to pass on to our uh, to the next person who is selected we need to deliver them a better city than the one we received first of all fiscal balance like i said secondly we have the instruments for inclusive planning such as big data collaborative platforms the uh, urban uh, elements that help us achieve energy efficiency and uh, finally sustainable mobility the transformation of the city but always from a perspective of a future looking engineering for a city for a city that will belong to those who will be born in the future and which needs to maintain its natural splendor uh, and needs to stay far away from maybe bad news that only speak about catastrophes, floods, earthquakes. I think that this is the duty of humanity at large. The Catholic tradition, as, as we know, calls the Earth a sister Earth. Our sister Earth is our home. The sister Earth must be cherished and uh, Sister Earth, in the words of Pope Francis, is the common asset of humanity. And uh, it is not just the Pope who says this, but all of the major leaders who think about the future of the planet, uh, including the Dalai Lama, Lutheran uh, religious leaders, all of the major religious leaders in the planet have this notion of responsibility towards the planet. And now we need to raise awareness among the general population, educate the children to ensure the sustainability of the planet and therefore build the future step by step. If we just do a tiny step each time in the words uh, of another major figure, we will do what seemed impossible in the past. We must save planet Earth. Thank you.
Thank you. And just in, in closing out, uh, Rebecca and Mayor Adler, to come back to you, what, what's next uh, in innovative finance? Where do you see things heading? Rebecca, to come to you first. Okay, no pressure from a timing perspective <laughs> to cover a really big topic in a couple of seconds. Um, look, from our perspective, you know, the, the thing that we're quite focused on is blended finance. You know, when we stop, when we think about the scale of capital that's needed just for, uh, to address adaptation and mitigation alone, circa two trillion a year for the next 20 years, you know, obviously we can't rely on public sources alone to do that. The challenge um, is to get the private capital, which represents about $150 trillion, um, to come in and help to finance these types of projects. Uh, we are doing a lot of work around bringing together on a collaborative platform approach um, parties across uh, official uh, development assistance agencies, multilaterals, including uh, development agencies, uh, private capital, including ourselves and our own uh, investment capital, uh, other financial institutions, philanthropic capital, and family offices as well, to um, really from a reverse engineering perspective, to think about the challenges that to date have prevented the ability of private capital in scale uh, to come into these markets and trying to put together a structure that works not only for uh, the investors, but also for obviously the local stakeholders who are the ones who are looking to have these projects financed. Um, and I think the other aspect that we're, we're also very conscious about is um, a collaboration perspective because we know that not one party can do this on, on their own. So the approach we're taking, we hope, will be very much seen as a template to bring in other institutional capital behind us. And then over time, obviously, the end game is to create a more mainstream approach to these types of projects. And that will enable capital, private capital, to continue to come in and reduce the barriers and obviously help the various cities and entities around here and across the globe um, achieve, and for all of us, uh, obviously achieve the capital that's needed to address these very challenging issues. Great, thank you so much. And uh, Mayor Adler, just to turn to you in less than one minute, uh, we could carry the conversation on all day, but uh, where do you th see things going next? on right, so let's see if I can see if I do this in less than a minute. I, I think that you have to recognize that there are four areas for revenue uh, sourcing, and I'd like to propose a fifth. The first one is going to be the public subsidization, certainly in the United States with what's happening with the administration. There's a lot of infrastructure dollars that are available. But I think it's finding the tie for public subsidization between climate change and jobs, climate change and mobility, climate change and, and the urban landscape. The second area I think is philanthropic. We have in our Austin Energy a premium program that uh, customers can participate in where they actually pay more for uh, the, the same kind of power, the same level of power, but it helps subsidize green projects. And we find that our community is participating that way on a voluntary basis. But I think philanthropic is going to be important. The third area is to recognize that municipalities can create value and they can create resources by their land development code, by their building standards, by their regulations. And oftentimes that can be the income or the resources that prime the pump. The fourth area is the public-private partnerships, uh, finding those intersections between those things that provide the return uh, and the community benefits. And the fifth one that I'd like to propose is I watch what's happening at the, at the, the, the national meetings in COP and countries are being asked to, to, to contribute and certainly the northern hemisphere countries toward the southern hemisphere countries and I think that C40 ought to do the same thing but we never get asked that way as mayors and cities in the northern hemisphere and I think that C40 ought to create a bank or a fund or a resource where cities in the northern hemisphere are asked to contribute uh, by way of equity or reparations to the cause as well. I know that my city, Austin, Texas, would participate in that kind of program because I don't think that cities can rely on the nation states to do this. I think cities are at the forefront of this, both in terms of activity, and I think that the cities ought to participate also in terms of revenue generation. No, great. And
And thank you so much. And we heard similar messages yesterday from Mark Watts and from Mayor Khan from London. Um, and it li links nicely to this discussion today. Please join me in thanking our panel and for those amazing insights and for some ongoing, very interesting conversations. Thank you. What a wonderful panel and, and what a powerful message of the mayor of Curitiba um, to leave a, a planet and a city better than the one that we found, no? And I, I think this is, this is the message for all of us, no? To leave a planet better than the one that we found. Okay, so next up, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce a spotlight on climate budgeting from governing mayor of Oslo, Raymond Johansson. Thank you, and uh, it's great for me to be here to talk about the climate budget. Most people who have invited me to a discussion about Oslo's climate work will know three things. One, in 2030, we aim to have cut 95% of our direct emissions. Two. This is one of the most ambitious targets adopted by any city anywhere. Three, the Oslo climate budget is a key governance tool for the climate work. When I later hand it over to the panel, you will know how the climate budget came about, how critical it is and how we use it. When my city government came in power in 2015, we said that we are going to count carbon the way we count money. The climate budget I'm talking about today is the technical outcome of that statement, a politically adopted outcome. Now that I have your attention, I think there are four things you need to know about the climate budgets. First, you should know what it does. You all know that goals are not actions and measures. The climate budget translates, translates overall climate goals into concrete on the ground measures. Second, you should know that this is not a new governance process. It is a part that you are very familiar with, the budget process. However, it does more than estimate the cost of climate measures. It does that too. Equally important, it states who is responsible for the different measures and, where possible, it estimates the expected cuts in emissions. Make it as a formal budget process 
that will break down silos. Yet, it's still a formal process, but it connects the finance and climate departments. The climate budget work requires that agencies and departments collaborate. Here, the informal discussions are key. They speed up the development of new measures that make them better, all nestled in a formal system. Third, climate budgeting is a climate ownership and climate mainstreaming. All departments and underlying entities have a formal responsibility for reaching Oslo's climate targets. For making climate a part of all the services that produce producers for our citizens. Fourth, you should know that the climate budget keeps you honest on the progress. And for us, Oslo, the 2023 climate budget estimates that identified measures will take us to 79% reduction in 2030. 79 is not 95. To be truly ambitious, you need to be honest. The climate budget tells us that we are not there yet. Nevertheless, it also tells us where we do, do, need to do more and who need, we need on board. <coughs> Often, uh, that the national government needs to act, either is so that we can demand fossil-free construction citywide so that we can establish zero emission zones or to reduce the risk of investing in zero emission technology through creating predictability in the market. So keeping us honest and calling on honest others so that we can show measures that will take us to 95% as soon as possible. Those four things, from goals to measures, using an existing system, the budget, ownership and mainstreaming of climate work, and honesty on progress. We need all four in city climate leadership towards the 1.5 degree target. Oslo is not big, 700,000. However, we have a responsibility to come up with solutions that have the potential to go big. C40's pilot on climate budget is the start of doing just that. Go big on climate budget. I'm humbled by the response and the eagerness to develop climate budgets in 12 pilot cities. Thank you for that. C40's commitment to work could do not have come at a better time because so many of you show that you are ready to take the extremely demanding task of climate governance. Thank you for your vote of confidence and thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor Johansson, for your commitment and your message. Next, we have in conversations with city leaders who are integrating climate change in their city governance process and how they are beginning to apply climate budgeting principles. So please give a warm welcome to the mayor of Tishwaini, Randall Williams, and Lord Mayor of Copenhagen, Sophie Jetstorp, 
and also our moderator, Managing Director of Communications and Events at C40, Lamia Sinusi. Bienvenidos. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. And thank you very much to um, Governing Mayor Johansson. Uh, we absolutely do want to be ambitious, and I think climate budgets definitely play a strong role in transforming city governance and mainstreaming climate action. Um, a lot of cities are inspired by Oslo's actions and have followed their lead uh, on working to implement climate budgets, but what have their experiences been so far? So this is what I want to be asking our esteemed panel and what we'll be talking about this morning. So let's begin and jump straight in. Mayor Williams. Chuane is one of 12 C40 cities that are already exploring how to implement their own climate budget, supported by Oslo and C40 cities. How are you integrating climate action in your planning and budgeting processes today, and how can it be further improved with a climate budget? Good morning to everybody here. Well, last year, the city of Chuane adopted uh, the climate action plan. And obviously, we sort of had to think about how we're going to implement uh, our action plan. And, um, and the way we wanted to do it was to entrench it in government. So what we wanted was a whole of government approach so that um, we tell the internal departments that it becomes your responsibility uh, to set reduction targets. So we had to integrate it in our budget planning and processes and also make sure that the targets that the internal departments uh, set become mainstreamed in, in all our processes. And that part of that should also be that when we do investments, we make sure that these are green investments that we prioritize. So also, the approach that we had to take had to break down the traditional silos that exist between finance and, and any action plans you have uh, as far as climate change is concerned. So we then decided to become part of the pilot program for uh, as far as the climate budget is concerned because we wanted that responsibility given to all the officials in, in the city. And we then looked at our current systems. And our current systems, we already use what we call uh, um, a capital planning system that we use for all our, our capital projects. That's part of our capital budget. And by using uh, the, the, uh, what we call the CAP system, we can then monitor uh, as far as the delivery of our action plans are concerned. So the CAP system also allowed us to align the, the actions that we had to take with our city budgeting process. And in addition for us to gain more experience, we then also participated in our national treasuries, uh, what they call a climate budget tagging uh, pilot project to give us more experience. And, and one thing we have decided that in implementing uh, our climate budget, we cannot simply do what Oslo has been doing. We need to look at our own social and economic uh, circumstances. And because of that, we decided we're going to use a staggered approach, uh, um, implement our climate action plan over a period of three financial years. Because at the same time, what we need to do is, after your first year, you sort of have to re-look at your plans 
how its higher climate budget has been implemented, and then you need to strengthen or enhance your plans for the next year. So you complement uh, your, your current knowledge with learned experiences. And then also, obviously, when implementing a climate budget, you also monitor to see whether what you're currently doing is sufficient to reach your targets, because ultimately that's your goal. You've got an act climate action plan with targets you need to achieve. And, and that then help you to, read, to, to address any shortcomings in you implementing your climate budget. And, and also the advantage of a climate budget is it's, it's transparent and visualizes the type of challenges that you are facing and then also whether your efforts are aligned with you progressively moving towards those targets. And one thing that's very important about a climate budget, you need the proper political support because at the end of the day, you want to make sure that your climate budget is entrenched in the budgeting processes because especially now, the type of circ political circumstances we have in South African metropolitan cities, that most of our metropolitan cities are governed by coalition governments. And unfortunately, um, some political parties are not happy uh, to be in opposition all the time. So they continuously bring what is called motions of no confidence to get you out of government. So the problem is, if you now leave government, what does that mean to your climate budget? Do these decisions get overturned? And that's why it's so important that you entrench your, your, your climate change decision, your climate action plan as part of your official budget that it cannot be easily overturned by incoming officials because it's actually part of the actions of, of the administration. So that's why we, we see the climate budget as a key governance tool that needs to be entrenched in the city and it needs to be mainstreamed and institutionalized. Thank, Thank you very much. And over to you, Lord Mayor Anderson. So Copenhagen has recently committed to join Oslo. Now, how can a climate budget secure the delivery of Copenhagen's existing targets and commitments? Mm. And what have your experiences been so far? Well, when I came into office as Lord Mayor, I said that Copenhagen still needs to be even more inclusive, uh, even more sustainable, and uh, even more equal. And um, we've been working on these uh, very difficult uh, climate targets for many years mm -hmm. in an action plan uh, and, of course, targeting that. But a lot of times it becomes a very technical dis discussion about how to reach the target. And what we have found uh, when we suggested to do the climate budget as in Oslo and other places is that we need to think uh, the climate into everything that we do and not only to make it like a, a technical discussion in, in one part of the administration. And therefore, in uh, spring 2022, uh, shortly after I took office, we, uh, we decided to developing our climate budget. And um, fortunately, there was a very clear signal from the city council that they wanted to take part of this and they wanted to approach this. And that meant that, um, that we could start out by uh, talking to every part of our departments in order for them to, to start working with this as a tool. Um, our recent negotiations for the budget in 2023 uh, was the first time that we actually took this uh, new tool into, into account. Uh, and, uh, you know, we couldn't start out with a fully fledged budget. <laughs> Uh, climate budget, but we started out where we know that it's most important, and that was uh, the focus on the highest uh, emissions first, mm -hmm. and that was in construction and in transportation. And um, our first try was in no way uh, perfect, but everybody got into the debate and everybody bought into the idea that we have two levels 
a budgeting now, uh, a budget for the, for, for the financial, and a budget that counts in the, into the climate and the reductions that we, that, we want to need, that we want to meet in order to become a climate neutral city in 2024. Uh, 25 and and also uh, the new target which we're working on right now how to to be climate positive in 2035 so we will improve this climate budget in the upcoming years i'm i'm most certain um but uh, but now we have started out and uh, and we are keep going to work with this in the in the upcoming years Fantastic. It's a lot of transformation uh, and a lot of change as well, and necessary change. Um, and, you know, it's a lot of change as well for the way in which people work in city government. And, and also with a lot of that comes some challenges. So how are you engaging the city government and administration and bringing them along the journey with you, kind of ensuring that everyone across your city understands the importance of this? I, maybe I'll go over to uh, Mayor Williams first. Well, obviously, um, you need your officials to implement your plans. As, as politicians, we can only give guidance and leadership. Mm. So for them to action a, a climate action plan, you need specific projects that you can monitor. You need to have the ability to identify uh, these projects, how are these projects going to be financed? You know, so you need to capacitate your officials because they need to take responsibility for implementing your action plan. Yeah. But obviously there should always be political support uh, that they need. So you need to engage as well with various stakeholders to make them aware of what you want to achieve. You, there are certain targets. You move progressively towards those targets, but ultimately you need to capacitate your officials uh, to lead and implement the process. Hmm. And Lord Mayor Anderson. Well, one of the things in Copenhagen is that we are a city that are still growing. And of course, there's a lot of discussions about that. How can you be a city that is growing and at the same time you want to save the emissions? And, um, and, and another thing is that people, some people were worried about, is this just another paper tiger, I think we call it? You know, is this just a way that we sit back home and then we, we, we try to, to count a lot of things that we already do instead of just keep acting? So, however, we were very happy to see that actually the people working in the administrations uh, we're taking all of this into account and as I said, it was a very clear message from the from the city council that now we are trying this out and um, I believe that a strong political demand for integrating climate in everything we do uh, was the way it was the turnover uh, for this to be a success and I think also politically uh, a lot of the politicians have been very happy that uh, that is okay to discuss uh, not only simple, uh, you know, sometimes when we talk about climate action, we look at the symbols, you know, how can we easily go out to the people of Copenhagen and tell them, you know, now look at this, this is, this looks green. But with this climate budget, now we can also go out and say, if this looks very boring, you might even see the improvement here and then, but it had made a whole difference when it comes to emissions. And that makes the political debate a little different than just, you know, sometimes being who can compete of looking the most green instead of actually being the green and taking the green choices, the sustainable choices. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this is very bold decisions you both uh, made here and, and it places the responsibility of this on absolutely everyone, which to your point earlier means that, you know, you're integrating it even more and makes it more difficult to overturn. So what I'd like to close this panel with is kind of one last sort of fire round question. What is your vision for the future? So what impacts do you foresee this could have on your city in two years time, five years time, maybe even 10 years time? Um, Mayor Williams. Yeah, look, if, if you want to implement your climate action plan, you cannot just put processes in place to mitigate the harm of, of carbon emissions. You need to take bold steps. 
And, and, and one of the bold steps that you can take is to put a climate budget in place. You need to mainstream it as a mechanism uh, to implement your climate action plan. And, and by doing that, you'll be able to monitor and track a dedicated resources that you, you, you apply then to reduce your harmful emissions, you know, and, and you will be able to have a very transparent system in place uh, that you can always, uh, as, as especially when you do political oversight, you'll be able to track what the administration is doing in implementing, at the end of the day, your plans. So it's very, very important to, 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 to mainstream it because also when you mainstream something, there's a quick, what they call quick institutional acceptance and recognition of that plan, because otherwise, if you don't mainstream it, it will remain pie in the sky. Well, my hope is that in a few years' time, we'll actually have two bottom lines when it comes to making decisions in the city council, yeah. and one that is uh, financial, but also one that is climate, climate friendly, as you can say. Um, and, uh, and, and that is, uh, that will also be a change in culture because that means that when you decide on building a school or taking initiatives to make better uh, food for the elderly or taking care of them or when you, uh, when you do procurements, for instance, uh, not only construction and transportation, but also procurements have a very big impact on the climate and how we do it, then it's very important that we start thinking uh, not only within the finance sector or the technical department, but that we actually think about this in every department, whether or not that be the, the kids and the schools department or the elderly department or the social department. That is something that is, that is something that we consider and work with. And as you mentioned, that we mainstream it. Mm -hmm. So it becomes transparent for people. What are the exact measures and what is it that we need to invest in in the future? in order not only to look green, but actually become sustainable. Um, because sometimes people get very surprised, <laughs> yeah. you know, what they think is the right thing to do. And then when you look at the bottom line, when it comes to CO2 emissions or reductions, it might not be the right place to focus right now. It might be something else. But in order to do that, you need to have the transparency, the mainstream and the debate in every department and not only in, the, in some close sections of the, of the city and the city council. I think it's very exciting and what we also hope is that now we get the people of Copenhagen to take part of it with local, local climate summits uh, and, um, and be more transparent also to the, to the Copenhageners so they can uh, be part of it as well. Wonderful, we look forward to that invite. <laughs> Thank you both very, very much. And I think with this we conclude today's panel. Thank you everyone. Mayor, thank you so much, Lamia. Very, very interesting conversation. Now we're going to take a small break before the day's final thematic session, which is going to be United in Action to Confront the Climate Crisis. So um, take this opportunity to, to get to know each other, to connect with each other. We have so much in common, and for sure we can create wonderful projects together. So I will see you back here at 11.35. Thank you for your attention here in Buenos Aires and online.
take your seats. The session is now starting. Por favor, ocupen sus asientos. La sesión está por comenzar. Please take your seats. The session is now starting. Por favor, ocupen sus asientos. La sesión está por comenzar. Welcome back to the stage, your Master of Ceremonies for the C40 World Mayors Summit, Vanessa Hauk. Hola a todos, bienvenidos de regreso. Welcome back to the main stage at the C40 World Mayors Summit. In the final thematic session of the day, we're going to turn our attention to C40 City's impactful and successful climate actions. City leaders and global partners will highlight how cities are effectively collaborating to meet inclusive climate goals, exploring the mechanisms available to empower cities to take meaningful action, and sharing best practices on how to inspire and maintain momentum. For the first spotlight on of the session, please welcome to the stage, Rafael Traskovsky, Mayor of Warsaw. Bienvenido. Buenos dias a todos. Good morning. I was always saying that these conferences are mostly about networking, uh, which is uh, the opportunity to meet uh, fantastic people and to talk about the challenges that are before us. Uh, what I wanted to tell you very briefly in those four minutes is uh, the multiple uh, crises and the multiple challenges that we are facing in Warsaw and that we are facing in quite a lot of uh, cities uh, in Europe right now. Because it turns out that it is the cities which are at the forefront of change, but that there are cities who also need to face some of the most important challenges head on. Of course, it all started with the pandemic and six waves of pandemic, and it turned out that it was us who were on the front line dealing with that crisis. Then uh, when we thought about getting out of uh, the crisis, uh, the war uh, in Ukraine erupted. And of course, we had to deal with a massive influx of uh, refugees. 300,000 refugees from Ukraine came to Warsaw uh, in March, uh, and now 200,000 are still in my city, which uh, means that uh, the uh, size of Warsaw, when it comes to population, was increased by uh, almost uh, 12%. Uh, and of course, uh, the conservative Polish government does not uh, have a strategy, the European Union does not uh, have a long-term strategy, and uh, it seems that we are left with the problem on our own. And of course, the energy crisis, which is uh, a problem uh, on its own, uh, the rising inflation, the rising prices of commodities, and on top of that, uh, the price uh, of energy. We were warning our friends uh, in uh, Western Europe that if you do uh, business with thugs uh, like Putin, uh, when you make yourself dependent on Russian fossil fuels, sooner or later, uh, problems will arise. And of course, we still want to be ambitious because that's the most important message that I have for you. Uh, this is not a moment to lower our ambitions. On the contrary, if we are to fight with uh, the energy crisis, if we are to uh, have stability uh, on the continent and in the world, we need to speed up our transition. We need to speed up our efforts to fight global warming. We need to speed up all of our efforts uh, which are aimed to make us uh, independent. And that's exactly what we are doing in Warsaw. This is not the time to stop our efforts. This is the time to actually speed them up. 
That's why, of course, we are investing in public transportation. That's why we are retrofitting our buildings. That's why we are preparing a low emission zone. That's why we are uh, changing the coal, coal power stoves uh, into heat pumps. But of course, it is difficult at this moment in time because the most important thing for us is to be with the people. Uh, and the uh, conservative government in Poland decided to uh, hand out coal subsidies and, of course, shifted uh, the uh, task onto our shoulders. And we are doing it because we need to be helping the people because we cannot uh, afford a situation in uh, which uh, someone could freeze to death. But that needs to be transitory. That does not mean that we are not going to increase our efforts to fight climate change. And here I come to the message, guys. We have a difficult, many of our cities have a difficult because we have governments who do not want to take the responsibility, sometimes for even denying global warming, that they are not accepting ambitious solutions. And that means that, of course, we need to do it on our own. And make no mistake, we will be ambitious. Uh, we will take the responsibility. But we need to stay together on that, because some of those decisions are pretty controversial. And many cities in other parts of the world have already done it. New York, Paris, London. We need to talk about these experiences. We need to demonstrate them as C40 in order to convince the people, in, in order to raise the awareness that these ambitions are actually paying out because the air will be cleaner, because we are going to take the responsibility, because we are going to uh, stay ambitious and fight global warming because there is no other planet. So the most important challenges before all of us is to use C40, all the other networks that we have. Uh, we are active in the Euro cities. I'm a member of the Committee of the Regions of the European Union. There are many other networks in the world. We need to use them all to create a network and of course, C40 will be pivotal for it in order to influence the situation in the world, in order to drive the efforts forward, because it is us who are responsible, the cities who are responsible for quite a, a percentage of emissions, but it is also us who are close to the people and who are under pressure to be ambitious and to deliver change. So we need to do it together. We need to do benchmarking. We need to show the results, uh, how uh, effective we can be uh, and uh, what impact does it have uh, on our cities and on the world and on the people that it's beneficial for the people and we need to stay united in order to uh, fight all of those forces which want to lower our ambitions and finally the last thing I want to tell you if we want to stay ambitious and also when we want to fight populism which is rising everywhere we need to support the cities also financially because we are not going to do it alone that's why within the European Union, we've been positing for some direct financing of our ambitions by the European Union, and we can also do it on an international level. That's the message I want to leave you with. Even though there are multiple crises, even though we are the ones taking the brunt of responsibility, we cannot lower ambitions. We need to stay together, demonstrate to everyone that we know how to do it, and we need to, sh to shout to the decision makers on a national level and supranational level show us the willingness and show us the money because we need it in order to drive change forward thank you very much thank you so much to mayor transkovsky for your passion and powerful message Okay, so next we are in conversation with city and business leaders on the importance of strengthening multi-level collaboration to accelerate action. So please welcome our panelists, Jasper Nuhat, CEO of Veldania, Iqbal Singh Shahal, Municipal Commissioner of Brihan Mumbai Municipal Corporation, and our moderator, Agustina Lopez, journalist at Todo Noticias. Bienvenidos. Hi, good morning. Welcome, everyone. We all know that climate crisis is no longer a problem for the future generation. It is a today problem. Having emissions by 
2030, while building climate resilience and equity demands a global engagement, impactful policies and positive leaderships and cities are a crucial part in this equation. Joining forces for immediate action between cities and with national governments uh, can help replicate and build up those actions, those climate actions more rapidly. So today in this panel, we are going to explore how cities can benefit from regional, national and global partnerships. So with no further introduction, we are here with me, uh, Mr. Iqbal Sikh Chahal, Municipal Commissioner of Brigham Mumbai Municipal Corporation, and Mr. Jesper Nugard, CEO of Real Dania. Thank you for being here. So, Commissioner Chahal, Mumbai is impressively leading the climate action, being one of the first cities in India to present a climate action plan aligned with Paris Agreement. So, how is Mumbai mobilizing existing global or local networks, city-to-city -city partnerships and collaboration with others to inspire other cities <coughs> into these kind of actions? In fact, first of all, I would like to thank uh, C40, uh, especially Shruti, who has helped us frame uh, and now uh, start implementation of Mumbai Climate Action Plan, which call, we call as MCAP. And uh, it has been a great journey and now we are absolutely determined and uh, we are on it. And uh, it, it, is, it is a network at the global level, lo at the local level, and uh, I would especially also mention WRI, who have been our source partners. And uh, at the global level, for our uh, uh, budgeting of, uh, for the climate uh, program and uh, we, for the creation of climate cell, we are already in collaboration with uh, Oslo and 10 other cities in the world. And at the local level also, uh, it's, it's a great uh, networking of uh, NGOs, people from academia, institutions, stakeholders, our eminent citizens, elected representatives, so all are uh, uh, on the same wavelength now because of networking. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, networking is the key. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Newgard, uh, Denmark is one of the most ambitious countries in terms of, of cutting emissions and reduction emissions. What's the role of the cities in these policies and what did you learn from working with mayors? Thank you and, uh, and thank you for having me here. Uh, it's <clears throat> cities are crucial uh, in this and, uh, and network and to, to share knowledge and to work together is, is crucial to do something about this. I, I represent a, a Danish uh, philanthropic association mm -hmm. uh, where we work with quality of life and have been doing that for the last uh, 22 years, uh, mostly in Denmark. And we decided uh, uh, almost 10 years ago to support C40. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we have seen is a, an extremely ambition, ambitious work on having the mega cities working with the climate action plan. And coming from a very small country, Denmark as itself is five, six million people. Uh, we are nearly not big enough to be a mega city for the <laughs> whole country. Uh, but Copenhagen, as you saw on the previous panel, is a member of C40 and they made a climate action plan just like the big cities in uh, C40. And we took the decision to try to take this method uh, developed by WRI, C40 and all good people around the world that the mega city are doing, trying to say, take that system and transfer it to the, a little country like Denmark. We have 98 municipalities and right now we have 96 of them who have signed up to do a Paris-aligned mm -hmm. climate action plan. One third of them has made it. The rest of them is in a process of making it, will be finished uh, uh, mid next year. So, so this is about creating leadership. It's yeah. very important that the big cities are doing what they're doing. And this summit is about the big yeah. cities. But it's also important to trying to transfer that knowledge to thousands of cities, all the smaller cities, the race to zero. And that's what we have tried to do in, in little Denmark. And the method is, is quite easy to, uh, to adapt. And, and our experience has been that all mayors want to show the same leadership as the mega cities uh, mayors and, and uh, trying to be on the forefront of the action, trying to make a plan 
that can make them aligned with the Paris Gold, trying to be a, vo a voice that can engage them in, the, in, the, in, the, in this very important task. And I, I love the, the work that we have to do this together. And this about uh, united in action yes. is, is it's a way of having uh, mayors work together in big cities and in smaller cities. Yeah, and when you start, it's easier to keep going and, and enlarge that network that you were referring. Uh, Commissioner Chahal, what's the next step for this Climate Action Plan for Mumbai? You know, I, I strongly believe that uh, uh, networking or uh, collaborations are on one part, but to achieve uh, what we all want to achieve, the climate change mitigation, there has to be of proper uh, projects, they have to be like Williams and Mayor. Just I was just listening to him. We must have projects, we must have targets, we must have finance in place, and we must have achievements. Mm -hmm. So, like for example, in Mumbai, uh, we have decided that uh, 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 since 20% of emissions come from public transport, uh, we have decided that in the next one year's time, we will replace the entire public transport by electric vehicles only. We already done 600 buses now. We are doing 4,000 next year, and ultimately, we even uh, need to go. Uh, we are planning to go to 10,000 electric buses in the city, so that public transport at large uh, takes care and uh, we mitigate this 20% emissions. Secondly, Mumbai is a is a is a metropolis, the second most dense city in the world. Mm -hmm. We have a population of nearly 15 million now, and if you see the peripheral area, it becomes 25 million. So in this, in this city of the scale, we use something like 4,000 milliliters of water MLDs per day. And recently, we, we have issued uh, the work orders for uh, wastewater treatment plants. It's one of the biggest projects anywhere in the world. It's $3 billion in one go, and in which we'll convert 64% of our total sewage water back to portable. Mm -hmm. So this is another target we have to achieve. Once we achieve the target, automatically things start happening. Then we had a lot of drinking water dams which supply water to over 25 million people. So we, we started building now solar projects, floating solar projects there. We, we are building hydro project for clean energy. Then we, have, we are lucky to have 16% uh, of the geographical area in Mumbai, which is a national park with a lot of flora, fauna, wildlife. So uh, we have additionally put in another 800 acres of land for this national park. Then uh, for construction industry, we have now made a law that any permission which is given, given henceforth, uh, the developers are supposed to, they shall plant Miyawaki forest, which grows 10 times faster than other trees. We need to increase our uh, uh, green uh, area to 35% from existing 20% in Mumbai now. So like these are targets, unless you have these targets in place, unless you have the achievements in place, only then actually tangible things start happening. Mm -hmm. So we are very focused on that. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's very interesting, the contrast between Copenhagen, the, it's a smaller city, and uh, Mumbai, which is a huge city, but they all need plans and a, and a guide and alignments to, to keep going and uh, keep getting closer to tackle climate crisis. Uh, Mr. Newgard, the D Decade 2020 initiative created a national climate movement for municipalities. What do you think is the key factor of success in this initiative? <clears throat> I, I think the key factor of success is, uh, uh, just like the commissioner said, uh, working together. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, even it's in a big city and in a small city, you can only solve this if you work together. Yeah. And I know mayors are the most important persons in the world, but if they don't cooperate with others, they, they won't succeed. And, and I think DK2020 showed people that if they work together with businesses, if they work together with each other, if they have all the, the relevant resources around them, it, it, it can be done. And we just made a, a study uh, with the first 20 pilot municipalities participating in, in DK2020. And it shows that the Danish ambition is to reduce uh, the CO2 emission by 70 percent, okay. which is a very ambitious yeah. uh, goal. And, and the, the study showed that the first 20 municipalities almost uh, by themselves could reach that goal uh, if all the plans were implemented. So it's very ambitious 
plans uh, the, the local leaders have made. And these leaders chose to organize themselves so uh, the, the, the knowledge flowing among uh, mayors, among their staff, were better and, and uh, deeper. So the political, uh, <clears throat> the, the political um, commitment has raised quite a lot. They are in the forefront of, of doing it, and uh, it has created a climate engagement together with local residents, together with local businesses, together with researchers, and together with civil society, which uh, we haven't seen uh, in that scale before. And they work uh, across uh, municipalities, the, the different departments. Uh, they work with uh, mainstreaming mitigation and adaptation actions. Uh, uh, they are, have focus on, on inclusion. So I think this system, this is about taking the mega cities way of working, scaling it down to smaller mm -hmm. cities, has shown it, it can be done. It, it's, it's very effective and uh, it can create uh, a new movement and a strengthen uh, of this very, very uh, important task. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, the, the civil society, and I think that's really important to get everyone on board because, uh, well, cities are <laughs> main, uh, mainly uh, the place where people live, they raise their kids. Uh, it's important to get everyone on board. And sorry, how can the Daiki 2020 model uh, can be shared to other cities that want to scale up actions like, as you mentioned? Yeah, I mean, just like our DK2020 system is a copy from what C40 did in the megacities, our system can be copied as well. Yeah. And, and maybe it should be copied. And if any of you want to have more knowledge about it, this report I just mentioned, we have, uh, w which was written in Danish, which is not so helpful to many of you, uh, we have translated it into English. If somebody wants to, to read about the concrete way and the concrete plans made in smaller cities, we have a... Uh, a very easy to, to uh, engage with PowerPoint presentation in English. So if any of, of you want more information about the DK2020, I mean, right now, uh, 96 out of 98 municipalities uh, in Denmark uh, is on the same uh, uh, page as, as the rest of C40 organizations. And that system can be, just like the mayor of Oslo before, uh, showed us how, how budgeting about climate can be copied to other cities. This system can uh, be copied and, and please do and please reach out to us if you want more information about it because this, this is key that we uh, inspire each other, uh, steal ideas from each other, use the good momentum uh, and if a lot of countries uh, could scale this down from the mega city and we still want to help the mega cities because it's, it's a, a very big part of the world, yeah. but a lot of people live in cities that are smaller than the mega cities. And if this system can be used by others, we would be very, very thrilled to help to inspire and give, share our knowledge about that with other countries, other leaders, other philanthropists, or whoever wants to, to be inspired uh, about the DK2020. That's great. And Commissioner Chahal, according to you, uh, what are the key challenges for your cities leading this climate action crisis? You know, I would say that uh, uh, one field which I see that is our uh, solid waste management. I've been discussing with a lot of uh, uh, eminent people uh, who I'm meeting the last two days. Uh, we, like in Mumbai, we have a challenge of a uh, lot of legacy, legacy waste with us, mm -hmm. which is about 25 million tons. Yesterday I was talking to the Methane uh, Hub people. Uh, I'm very happy that they are willing to help us. So this C40 is a great uh, platform uh, for uh, exchange of ideas, exchange of best practices, and exchange of technology. And uh, uh, with, with this, this C40 getting stronger, uh, they, they can help us, each, each of us, in uh, sharing best practices, and then we can launch them in our cities, and then for every country, uh, I would say a mega city uh, may have a different definition. Like in, 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 like in, in a country like India, a city with uh, say 100,000 people is a small city, but maybe in some Scandinavian countries, 100,000 population will be mega city. Mm -hmm. So but these so-called mega cities, they should be lighthouse for uh, the rest of the cities in that country. For example, India is a federal country uh, with a vibrant democracy and we have 28 states 
and uh, Mumbai is the capital of one of the federal states, Maharashtra, which has 42 big cities. And out of the 42 big cities, there are almost 10 cities with 1 million plus population. So this Mumbai's uh, C40 uh, uh, city can be a lighthouse uh, and uh, it can show the path to the other cities. Mm -hmm. And that is how this movement can spread like wildfire in a positive manner. Mm -hmm. So, and then this is how it is going to touch the entire world. So, th so see what has C40 has envisaged, it can uh, literally uh, be a game changer in the years to come. Mm -hmm. And uh, this has been a great idea and I must congratulate uh, uh, people who have organized this C40 concept and it's such, it is such a, such a positive thing that I'm really proud of it now. That's very important. So, <laughs> that's all the time we have for today. Thank you both. It's, it's been a really meaningful and interesting conversation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to our panelists and to Agustina for that great conversation. And now for our next Spotlight On, we are delighted to hear from the mayor of Guangzhou, Johan Gua. So let's hear from him. Mr. Chair, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, friends, greetings from Guangzhou. It is a pleasure to join the C40 World Mayor's Summit 2022. On behalf of the Guangzhou Municipal People's Government, I would like to extend my congratulations to the summit. Sincere thanks to the City of Buenos Aires for its excellent organization and best wishes to all guests and people of the attending cities. To inspire the world beyond C40 cities with united action, the summit discusses solutions to the climate crisis and sustainable development during the pandemic, which is significant to the confidence and resolve of major cities worldwide to address climate change and promote sustainable development. The Chinese civilization has been advocating the unity of heaven and man and the pursuit of harmonious coexistence of man and nature. The concept and practice of ecological preservation has been enshrined in China's constitution and incorporated into the overall layout of socialism with Chinese characteristics. During his speech at the Leaders' Summit on Climate 2021, President Xi Jinping elaborated on the idea of a community of life for man and nature for the first time, emphasizing preserving a clean and beautiful world for future generations. This contributed a Chinese solution to a fair and mutually beneficial system for global environmental governance. So, Wan Shu vigorously implements the Xi Jinping thought on ecological civilization and implements the UN 2030 agenda while accelerating its digital, green, and international transformation. It strives to explore a way of harmonious coexistence and development of man and nature for megacities, a way with the characteristics of China, Wan Zhu, and the Times. We adhere to prioritizing ecological conservation and strengthening strategic planning. Wan Zhu formulated Wan Zhu Agenda 21 in 1996 as a strategic compass for urban development. In recent years, we have been committed to systemic governance and the integrated conservation of all ecological elements. We formulated an overall plan for land use for 2035, benchmarked against the UN SDGs. We optimized the protection of ecological agricultural space, ensuring the harmonious coexistence of man and nature. We persist in green development and promote energy saving and emissions reduction. We have implemented a double control plan for the amount and intensity of energy consumption, while while vigorously developing green and convenient public transport. We are accelerating the transformation in industries, energy structure, and lifestyle. In the past decade, CO2 emissions per unit of GDP decreased by over 50%, with an average annual decrease of 7.6%. At present, Guangzhou has 621 kilometers of subways in operation, ranking third among global cities. All the buses and over 88% of the cruising taxis are fully electrified, which won the C40 
2040 Bloomberg Philanthropies Award in the green technologies category. We stick to bottom line thinking and ecological preservation. We have implemented the strictest system of ecological preservation with thorough pollution control aimed at the air, water, and, and soil. We're striving to make Wanzhou's sky bluer, mountains greener, and water clearer. We have focused on ecological restoration and biodiversity protection. The expansion of the South China National Botanical Garden has begun. It conserved, conserves over 70,000 species of plants and will have over 20,000 species when its expansion is complete. We have also restored the Haizhou wetlands in the city center, which covers an area of 1,100 hectares, equivalent to the size of three central parks in New York and four Hyde Parks in London. It was accepted as a member of the International Union for Conservation of Nature. We preserve in openness and inclusiveness and participating in international National cooperation. We value the exchanges and cooperation with the UN, C40, ICLEI, and other international organizations. We are the first Chinese city to join the UN SDGs local voluntary review. We participated in the FAO Green Cities Initiative and cooperate with the World Bank to pilot China Sustainable Urban Cooling Project to contribute our experience to global climate governance. In the spirit of jointly building a community of life for man and nature and based on the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, Wanzhou will sincerely cooperate and communicate with C40 member cities in the future to promote international climate and environmental governance together. We will make greater contributions to addressing global climate and environmental challenges and promoting green urban development. Thank you very much. Muy bien, seguimos. And if you learn, if you enjoy learning about what the city of Wanzhou is doing, you can visit c40summit.org slash news to read more about all the climate actions that are taking place in C40 Chinese cities. Before we get to our next panel, let's hear from more city residents on what policies they think will help improve the well-being of their communities. So we have Jenny from Johannesburgo, who thinks building civic pride can help accelerate climate action. And also Chiara from Toronto, who wants to see everyone working together because she believes change does not happen in a silo. And she is absolutely right. So please continue sharing your thoughts on how cities can improve a residents' well-being by submitting your policy ideas at c40.org slash united in action. Or using, of course, the hashtag united in action and social media. And now to our last discussion of the morning. So please welcome our panelists, Sharon Deisma, mayor of Utrecht, Daniela Levinkava, la alcaldesa del condado de la ciudad de Miami, Y our moderator, James Gatica Mateston, a journalist at Canal 13. Bienvenidas. Bienvenida, alcaldesa. So, thank you very much. In this panel, um, as I was already mentioned, we're going to cover how existing um, uh, incidents of collaboration can help cities to achieve their climate uh, ambitions. And I would like to start with uh, uh, Mayor Living Cava. In your community, within your community, you're often called the uh, collaborator in chief. Can you tell us <laughs> about your efforts and how you have deployed that in Miami Day to earn that title? Yes, thank you so much. So yes, collaboration is also my middle name. So uh, definitely you can never collaborate too much uh, in, in my book. And uh, I was also elected to be county mayor of a region of 34 cities in uh, two years ago and the mandate to address climate change. So I'm here really with that sole purpose. And we all know that uh, we cannot get anything done if we do not have the will of the people. Uh, we, we have to have broad community support, so that means networks galore. Any network that, uh, that you're part of, even unlikely stakeholders, certainly business community, faith community, uh, civic groups, activists, young people, uh, and so on. And I just give some examples of, of some of the um, collaboration on steroids when it comes to climate. Uh, we had uh, the largest ever civic participation effort in Miami-Dade County called Thrive 305. Um, 
fully 1% of the population participated actively and prioritized uh, climate, among other things, and we have an action plan we're implementing. Uh, we also uh, have just now started developing a zero waste policy, and we do it always by going out to the community, asking their participation. We, we just did it last week, very exciting. I, I, we're learning here ways, but it's always about uh, what we like to say, nothing about me without me, so that people have buy-in, they have ownership, they have motivation to make a difference. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, uh, Mayor Sharon, you, besides being the mayor of Aldrich in the Netherlands, you're also the uh, COP27 ministerial envoy, and you will be in Egypt in two weeks. Um, though the uh, expectation for progress from national governments is, let's say, uh, pessimistic, uh, city's role and leadership and position is growing and growing and getting stronger with each cope. What are your thoughts, hopes, expectations for cities during COP27? Yes, well, uh, good afternoon uh, to all of you. I really hope that uh, we as uh, uh, mayors and representatives from the cities could be the game changer in Sharm El Sheikh. Uh, as uh, you stated, uh, we have not too much uh, high expectations on the negotiations. And the trouble is that cities are no formal partner, actually, within the United Nations framework of UNFCCC. And that should change, because what you see is that um, if you look at the Paris Agreement, a lot of the work that has to be done needs to be done within cities. And I can know, because I was a formal minister for the environment at the time that the Paris Agreement was agreed upon, and also on behalf of the European Union, one of the negotiators on the Paris Agreement. And now we're eight years uh, further, and what you see is that no real uh, action um, um, uh, is, is taking place. Actually, many scientists warn us that if we proceed like this, things terribly go wrong. And many cities worldwide already see things going wrong. If you look at the flooding of Pakistan, if you look at what happens, for instance, even in my own country, where we have drought, where we have flooding. Uh, so uh, climate change is already there. And the most vulnerable people worldwide suffer from it. And if we do not step up, then we really are in trouble. So I hope that as a special envoy on behalf of all of you, uh, the cities worldwide, um, we, we l l l hear our voice and we um, make uh, the change that uh, we want to see. That's great. I think everyone here and the world will be watching and see what comes up from COP27. Uh, Mayor Living Kava, um, uh, you have been leading um, engagement w in, in climate change with different levels in government. Could you tell us what approach and what city structure is making this possible in Miami-Dade? Yes, thanks. So I have four E's that are the framework of my administration. Engagement, I'll start with that E. Uh, again, we talked a little bit about it, really meeting people where they are, capturing their uh, emotions, their, something they care about, environment, uh, economy and equity. So I've organized my administration that way. Uh, again, I'll give an example. We have something that's held up as a national example, a um, four county compact that stretches from Key West to Palm Beach. Anyone familiar with Florida geography? That's a long way. And all of those counties collaborating uh, through their professionals, but also through public engagement, uh, and we have, of course, a growing environmental movement, especially young people who are demanding action. Uh, so we're setting common metrics, we're um, best practices, uh, moving forward uh, collectively. And uh, many of those young people are represented at COP, which is very exciting. Uh, I just want to comment too about COP26 in Glasgow, which was my first COP, mm -hmm. that the sense of excitement about cities was very, uh, palpable. And so I'm part of ICLE and now uh, with C40. I think that engagement, it's through the lo most local government that we can participate not only in our day to day actions, what we do to adapt and mitigate in our communities, but how we can shape uh, national and, and global policy. I think that. Uh, public discussion is very related with, the, with my next question for Mayor Sharon, because we know that cities need to go now 
transformative journey uh, to uh, approach uh, the residents, the people who live in the city, to, uh, to achieve these goals. Could you share with the mayors here and also uh, watching online um, who are committed with the same goals as you, of course, how to engage more citizens in tackling climate change? Well, I think that uh, what you should do is, uh, is act, obviously, and you should always uh, um, uh, search for public support. And what happens is that we need to be in a transition, for instance, uh, by example, an energy transition in Europe at this moment, mm -hmm. very vivid because of the war in Ukraine. And many people are scared for it because of it, because they think that they will not benefit from the transition. They will only pay the bill. And most of the times, those people who are the most vulnerable because they have less income uh, cannot afford the transition by themselves. So I think that governments should put their money where their mouth is, and not only on the national level, but also on the local level. So help these people out first. Let the transition, which is necessary to save our climate and to save the world, also be a transition which is just, social, just and fair. Uh, so you need to, for instance, what we do, uh, give those people who are now not able to pill, b pay their energy bills anymore mm -hmm. extra uh, help. And at the same time, if you look at the social housing, you should make the transition for this part first, because many private citizens who earn more money can uh, avoid, uh, um, can, can pay for the, the solar panels on their roof. But many people who are living in the social houses and depending on welfare, they cannot. So you have to, to take into targets those people who you want to help first. And they should see that, for instance, when their houses are isolated, when there is solar energy, they pay less every month on their energy bill. And this is how we need to, to win actually the hearts and minds yes. of our citizens. Because when we do this without them, we're doomed to fail. This is really important. So a social agenda must be included in all this climate policy. And you never hear national governments about this. It's the mayors who see this because they are working in practice. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, Mayor um, Daniela, you've been very active with the 100 Resilient Cities Initiative, and now you're taking your work on resilience uh, into a new pioneer work on heat management. How important is that and how you're working in this area? And, and what kind of management? Oh, C. No, heat. Oh, heat. Thank heat you. Management. Thank you. Yes, we had the very first in the world chief heat officer. Uh, very excited. And of course, now we've joined many others that have uh, recognized the silent killer that is heat. And I'll just mention that uh, while we have balmy uh, sea breezes and wonderful... Please come visit uh, in Miami. Yeah. I think the, the microphone. Mic. The microphone. Okay. I think it's back. Um, <laughs> we uh, have the, the most days of extreme heat of any of the areas in the United States. So we're extremely vulnerable. So I'm very excited that we've developed um, a heat action strategy, heat awareness, a heat season, an official heat season. Um, of course, everything we can do from cool roofs to uh, weatherization for, uh, and talking about social housing, which is not the term that we use, but really being aggressive about helping especially lower income households do what they need to do to reduce their bills, uh, uh, as was said. And um, I also just wanna say about hearts and minds you have to reach people where they are. Mm. So for example, on the heat issue, we have our farm workers, because we still have a large agricultural area, it's number two in our economy, and our farm workers have organized Que Calor is the, que cal que calor is the um, campaign, very effective, and other, many other workers exposed that we need to protect. Um, but for example, flooding. So people might not be so aware of climate change generally or temperature, but they see extreme weather and they see a hurricane and the damage. So they're organized around that aspect. So you have to really take people uh, where they are and then use that as the doorway to help them understand the larger issue. Thank you very much. And just one last question, um, um, Mayor uh, Sharon. You already mentioned some of the role that cities can take uh, and be part of COPE uh, to drive climate ambition and action. What would you say that is need to, to happen to, to unlock this? 
Well, um, I think that it is really, really important that you all step up and that your voices are heard and that you do what is necessary also within your cities. And now uh, we are going to COP27 and for the first time we will be there in an informal position but at the table. So we will organize together with the Egyptian presidency a so-called high level of ministers and mayors. It is an informal session and there we want to discuss, for instance, the so-called SEARCH initiative. It's about sustainable urban resilience for the next generations and it's with five themes on, like for instance, energy transition, finance and access to it for cities and expertise, but also issues like the energy transition, which we need to work out uh, uh, together also uh, with, for instance, the South um, uh, it, in, in order to become really effective. And I hope actually that this will not be um, uh, the, 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 the first time only that we are informal at uh, a COP, but that it will be the last time that we are informal. Because next time we need to have this position at the negotiation table where all the national governments are uh, stated. And I think that that is really important. Thank you for this. And you could help me. So if I only may conclude, because what do I have with me? A so-called call to action. And it is stated what I was been saying right now to you. Uh, and I hope that my voice will not be the only voice. Mayor Levine uh, uh, Kava has it already. And maybe she can say yes to the dress in one <laughs> moment. But uh, I really hope um, that uh, all mayors here representing their uh, cities will be able to subscribe it. Because when I go to Sharm el Sheikh, I would like to have so many uh, of your signatures under this call to action that when I raise my voice, all those national governments who are there know that it's not just my voice that they hear, but it's your voice actually. So please, uh, I have with my co-workers a lot of copies. You can read it and then you can sign it. Thank you very much. Mayor, I already saw you both chatting about this call of action. Any thoughts about what you have read already? Yes, I'm very excited because this is really a, a struggle that has we've been having. And when I was first elected in 2014 as a county commissioner, uh, the president had just uh, reneged on the Paris Climate Treaty. So I believe I was one of the first county governments, cities also did it, to adopt the, the climate treaty for our county very proudly, and we, we learned from that that, uh, that countries might be slow, but cities are fast. Indeed. Mayors, thank you mayors, so much. Mayors are fast. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for sharing your experience. It's been fantastic. And also you have some work, uh, homework, sorry, uh, head of COP27, and I know you're gonna be a great representative on behalf of, uh, of, of the mayors, right? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Muchas gracias a nuestros panelistas y para presentar nuestro último tema del día. We will now introduce the next topic of the day. Let me invite the director of the Global Environmental Facility, Carlos Manuel Rodríguez. Muy buenos uh, días, tengan todos un, un... Good morning, hello and greetings from Washington. First of all, I would like to apologize for not being there in person in the beautiful city of Buenos Aires. And uh, just to mention that I'm very happy to be participating in this mayor's summit um, uh, organized by the C40 platform. 
as the executive president of the Global Environmental Facility, it is a pleasure to be here today. I have been following the different presentations by the leaders and the mayors, and I believe it is absolutely paramount to identify the Global Environmental Facility as an alternative mechanism to move forward with these efforts towards more sustainable cities and uh, building a process towards greener and more resilient cities. The GEF was created as a mechanism to support the governments in the implementation of international environmental agreements, particularly the uh, climate change agreement, the agreement on uh, biological diversity and others. And the fund has evolved uh, in many different ways, becoming an option for financial and non-reimbursable assistance for critical essential actors in our efforts towards sustainability. I, I have been following very closely, and I congratulate the mayors for their leadership uh, and the actions that they have implemented in the cities. And the GEF has become an option that is available for mayors as well as for leaders of both small and large cities and also intermediate-sized cities to receive non-reimbursable funds for their efforts towards more resilient cities and for those transitions in the different sectors particularly uh, the transition in the transportation sector, uh, building efforts uh, to shift towards zero emission mechanisms, but particularly shifting towards a new paradigm for the mobility of citizens in a city of the future. The GF has supported more than 25 cities throughout the world, uh, dedicating more than $22 million and has become the optimal source uh, and that is closer and is more viable to use non-reimbursable funds, which were previously uh, only dedicated to central governments. The requirements uh, and the needs that mayors are conveying to us include access to financing, and I think that in this regard, the GF can be an alternative. Over the past eight years, we have covered different projects in different cities in developing uh, countries during the period called GF8 for the period 2022-2026 with the support of uh, donors, and we have increased the availability of financial resources so that the leaders of the city and the mayors can access GF resources in a more direct manner. And for this to reflect the initiatives and projects that are immediate, that are important and crucial for all cities. The GF has therefore become, as a result of these reasons, has become a suitable and appropriate mechanism to support efforts for transition and to build greener and more resilient cities in keeping with international uh, cooperation agreements. The GF can become an option and so that, so that cities, instead of working directly only with their national governments, can now uh, evolve and develop mechanisms so that uh, GF resources can be accessible to other stakeholders in cities, particularly the private sector and also non-state actors. The GF is very honored to be the main source of non-reimbursable funds for cities in their efforts to be um, greener and to better manage uh, waste, and also moving towards the paradigm uh, for mobility and transportation in the cities of the future. The GF will continue to work closely, and we seek to diversify investments and also expand coverage in terms of the geography and also uh, regarding the different cities that could work hand in hand with the GF. We thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to be a strategic partner for mayors at an international level. 
and we wish to continue increasing our portfolio and mobilizing more resources so that we can consolidate this political commitment that many mayors have expressed. Thank you very much and have a good day. Muy bien, muchas gracias a Carlos. Thank you so much, Carlos. At the end our morning sessions, let me take some time to tell you a little bit about uh, the rest of today's schedule. A buffet style vegan and vegetarian lunch is going to be served in the lobby and also in Sala Cortadera after this session ends, and this will be on until 2 p.m. We will come together again in this room at 2 p.m. for our closing plenary session, which features discussions about resilience and climate fi finance, and a very special message from somebody that uh, you really all want to hear, uh, a very international and uh, love figure. Uh, so for now, que disfruten su almuerzo, enjoy your lunch, and I will see you back here at 2. Thank you. Thank you.